All right. Let's do it. and shit laying out in the backyard. They're called ruins, Eddie. Ruins, huh? Yeah, ruins. <laughs> Good names. <laughs> Deep into this stuff, Joe. 
I'm sure he does. His 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 uh, YouTube channel is incredible. Oh dear. Good to see you all here. Hello there. Um, I hope everybody is doing well. Thanks for uh, waiting around. I saw you guys in the chat um, being pretty funny in there. So thanks for uh, thanks for tuning up or tuning in. I've um, sorry about that. I think there was a little bit of an echo, um, something to do with my uh, my sound setup. I think I, I nerfed it during the run up there, but I'll figure it out later. It, I think we'll be okay from now on. It's, uh, I think we'll be fine. But uh, yes, it's, I've had uh, some issues with, uh, as usual with this streaming setup that, um, I don't know, my computer crashed. I lost like all this configuration data in the VB audio. It doesn't matter, but I think uh, I think we're okay. Let me know if the sound is wrong, but I think, uh, I think we're good now. It's good to see you all. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. I think the last, what was the last live stream we did on this channel was, I think the Assyrian, like probably a couple months back, a little while back. And uh, yes, I have also been remiss. I haven't put a video out in a little while either, mostly because I've been on the road. Um, been traveling quite a bit. Been, uh, let's see, there was a couple of weeks back there in September in the Scablands with Randall Carlson, the Snake Bros, Gromerica guys. We ran two trips or two tours uh, through the Scablands. It was wonderful. Um, really good experience but I came home ba I basically had two days at home and then left for Egypt so I, I got back from that trip from in Egypt I think about what nearly two weeks ago now and uh, I'm in about four or five days going to be leaving for Egypt again uh, so I thought what we would do is I actually found a lot of really interesting things on this this trip to Egypt and we had some very interesting attendees on the trip so we'll get into that and I, I kind of wanted to share a few observations that we made uh, on this trip that I think are, are, are fairly significant um, little pieces of evidence, just little details. And it's, I think it is one of the big benefits, I think, of um, repeated repeated trips to, to Egypt. Let's, uh, let's nerf this music a little too. Um, we'll, turn this, we'll turn off the music in a minute. Um, just while we're talking about this up front, though, I thought I'd, uh, I'd have it on. But yeah, so this, there was some really interesting stuff that I saw in Egypt, uh, and again, it's, it, a lot of it comes from the ability to, I mean, I, I feel I'm privileged to be able to go back there every so often. And, you know, the first time you go, it's kind of really overwhelming, you're seeing everything for the first time, but then on, on subsequent sort of visits as you go in, it, you're really able to absorb some of those details and then look at specific little things, you know, like little details here and there. Um, it's little nuances that, that you can notice and even differences over time is a whole other thing. So uh, it's it's been good and I've, I've got a few, I've got like four or five things that we're going to go through today with footage and images, talk about them. Some of the best stuff's going to be at the end. Uh, and I will also say that I'm making a video about one of these particular topics we're going to get into today and I will get that out before uh, I leave for Egypt again. It's not going to be like a an hour long thing, but... Um, and I will do my best to keep up with the chat. I can see the chat going there. I have put on slow mode in the chat, so it's like every 30 seconds, I think, is the limit between messages. It should be fine, but I'll try and do my best to keep up with it. I will try and break for um, Super Chats and things like that. I did notice a couple of people sign up for um, channel memberships while the, uh, I guess, the uh, the uh, stream was, you know, the, uh, you know the, the I guess the, the web page for the stream was up. So thank you very much for those who did sign up for channel memberships. It's much appreciated. Um, Thank you very, very much, much, sir. sir. You're, a, You're gentleman a gentleman and a scholar. And, a scholar. and I think there's going to be an echo on the soundboard right now. I just don't know why. I'm going to have to figure that out, but we'll be okay. And greetings to everybody tuning in from around the world. I hope the time works for you guys. So let's, uh, without further jibber-jabber, let's, um, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Uh, and I will turn off the music for now. 
and we'll just be us. So, hope to see you all in the Scablands in May. Yeah, uh, I will probably be back there in May. Uh, we'll see how we go. Um, just while we're on the topic, yes, I mean, I do. I am off to Egypt again. Uh, I didn't mean to have two Egypt trips kind of back to back. It's just the way it worked out this year. But uh, I am putting together some plans for next year. So, in particular, um, if you're interested in a lot of that stuff, it, it probably helps to be a patron because I do give those guys advance uh, notice on that. I am planning a trip uh, to Turkey in April for a week, and it's a much reduced cost relative to things like the Egypt trips. Uh, it's kind of, I uh, got invited by the tourism ministry to, to go and see, you know, Gobekli Tepe, Karen, all of those sort of sites. And it's my first chance to go to, to, to Turkey. So I'm planning that for around the April time frame. And I'm hoping in the next week or so to start making kind of uh, definitive dates and announcing that. So that'll that'll come out. But it's only going to be a, a, a small number of people. So um, that will be coming out to, uh, I guess, to patrons and supporters first and then also to, uh, to, to, to the wider group. If I mean, I suspect it may sell out quickly. You summon. Five bucks. Just a thank you. Always enjoy your content. Thank you so much. Oh, Ancient Sanctum. <laughs> As always, thank you very thank much. You very thank you very much, much sir. sir. You're a You're gentleman, gentleman and a scholar. And a scholar. Uh, yes, and I apologize for the echo on the soundboard. I know it's I know it's there. So, uh, But anyway, let's let's get into this because I've got, like, like I said, four or five different topics that we can cover. And I've tried to set this up so we can see the chat and see the, the video window too. I've been, I've been prepping for this a little bit. Um... Steamboat Rock is incredible. Tons of granite erratics up there uh, in the Scablands. Yeah, so it's funny, isn't it? The Scablands, I wasn't really planning to talk much about the Scablands, but yeah, the, uh, around where Steamboat Rock is is where you get that basalt, the basalt plateau kind of, because there's a, a tilt to it and you start the granite, because the, the granite beneath it is much older and it, it sort of, it comes up and starts to to pop out uh, of the ground. Some of the granite that you see in the erratic fields and stuff up, up there in the Scablands too, some of that stuff came from Canada. I mean, it was carried down by the floodwaters. Curtis Horn, uh, thank you so much. Uh, 20 bucks. Have you seen the video by science YouTuber Anton Petrov on a Tunguska-like event in Chile 12,000 years ago? I have not. I'm familiar with Anton's work, though. Uh, I haven't seen that video specifically. Uh, I wonder if he's talking about the... Um, the uh, the Because um, I, I, I have a video on a paper that that dealt with... Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a dig... It's basically younger driest boundary sedement layers about that twelve to thirteen thousand years ago, but in Chile, and I don't know if if it's related. Maybe it's related because there's a big extinction event in South America too. People don't realize that. It's people often think of the extinction event being North America and Europe, but it was it devastated South America. Like they lost like eighty five percent of their megafauna in South America. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen it. But thank you so much for the super chat, mate. Granite Hancock. <laughs> Alex Delarge on the YouTube soundbar. It might be. I'm not sure who it is. Have I thought about writing a book? Yes, I have. And that is in my future, uh, for sure. So, uh, yes, the water short from him. Hello, wonderful people. That's Anton. So, anyway, let's 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 dive into this stuff just so uh, we can get started. And like I said, the good stuff, probably the best stuff's at the end of the stream. So we'll try and get through these uh, these topics. What I wanted to start with was kind of a look at some of the old kingdom architecture that we see at Giza. And this is kind of something you notice. It's not really pointed out a lot, but you notice it particularly if you go away from like the main areas at Giza. So, but obviously we're starting with one of the, the main areas here, which is the Valley Temple. Uh, incredible structure. One of my favorite structures of all time. You can see if we go a little bigger here, we go maybe 100%. You can see the you can see the grant, like the, these limestone blocks, right? So these huge, massive megalithic blocks of limestone that were likely quarried from the plateau, perhaps perhaps quarried from the um, the Sphinx enclosure itself. And these are giant blocks, you know. These these are 100 ton plus. Some of these are even larger than this. And in fact, some of the blocks up at the uh, the other end of this causeway, at the what they would call the Mortuary Temple of the Middle Pyramid, are, are even larger. We'll get to that in a minute. But this structure was then also cased in granite, yeah? So you can see the granite. Uh, you can see a lot of the, the, the limestone in a, in a casing. The, the inner core of the building uh, was all cased in, uh, was, it was all cased in granite. And in fact, if we go back to a fit here. So this is around the corner a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> the shapes in the, in the limestone, 
you know, these actually these squares, these little shapes that you see kind of cut out of it. That's that's where the the, the granite blocks were fit into it. So it wasn't like it was one big flat surface that that the granite blocks you know, were attached to. They they were all kind of locked in in three dimensions. Like these interlocking shapes, the granite was shaped and carved to fit uh, a lot of these different shapes here and there. And in fact, there's kind of an interesting part in this alcove where Robert Schock talks about, he thinks that some of the granite was actually formed to fit the erosion that we see on these limestone blocks. Because that's the other thing you notice here is that certainly parts of the limestone blocks are very heavily eroded. And, and this is a feature that we see on a lot of the really megalithic work up there, like particularly the limestone, right? It's, it's, it seems to show tremendous erosion. We also see the effect of time on a lot of the granite where the surface is spalling, it's coming off, it's not as perfectly polished as it once was, uh, that type of thing. Premier Pro money from Workmatic, thank you very much. Yes, we'll give you another. Thank you, thank Tracy. Tracy. You've got, You've got sharp, sharp eyes, eyes beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, Workmatic, massive supporter of the channel and the streams over on Twitch, mate. Thank you so much for the 20 bucks of the Premier Pro money. Yes, indeed. The Premier Pro uh, subscription price for me is going up. I didn't realize I was paying like a honeymoon rate, but now it's just sort of doubling the whole Adobe thing. They're raising their prices at the moment, which is fine. It's a tool I use. The point here is, is, is yes. Yeah, so I just want you to notice the characteristics of some of these blocks. Yes. So massive megalithic stuff stacked together, not even like they're not in straight lines. And remember that one of the reasons they say, well, they made it this way and this large. This is the, when I say they, I mean, it's kind of orthodox Egyptology. The explanation for this is, well, they wanted it to be earthquake proof, right? They, they didn't want these straight fault lines. Sound effects are doubled. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's, I, I could fiddle here, fiddle with it and try and fix it, but it's only going to happen for the soundboard, I think. So I think as long as my voice is fine, it'll be okay. I'll fix it. I will fix it. It doesn't, like I said, my sound effects, they all went haywire, which was annoying. I've got a complicated setup here, guys. It's just, these things take me forever to figure out. Um, and and the characteristic they say well this is you know this is old this is supposedly old kingdom you know fourth dynasty and it's it's supposed to be done this way because it's earthquake proof right so keep that in mind as we go through i want to look we're going to look at some of the more astonishing bits of architecture and stuff here so i'll just let this play for now uh the other elements that are here of course there's there's some of the casing blocks in granite weren't just casing stones yeah we so we also have a lot of these and we're going to look at the ones that are up there still at the giza plateau here and these are the cornice blocks, right? This this may well be upside down from from where it was originally. I think this is kind of upside down. But these are these are incredible shaped pieces of granite. These are the ones that, that Chris Dunn kind of called the smoking gun uh, pieces of evidence that you know you, you cannot do this with with simple hand tools and make these consistent compound curved surfaces. And we'll see some more of those examples here. Uh, let's move forward to a little bit of video. At the same area. So this is on the side of the Valley Temple up at Giza. There's some sound here. Uh, this is actually footage from when I was there with Jimmy. So you start thinking about that, it kind of messes with your noodle after yeah, a while. Yeah, that's like, like see, this is, see, this is the thing. Like, this is next level. Like, this is evidence of something very old and mysterious, yeah. and it's gone. And this could not... So I just, I do love these shots. I'll just say this. So you can hear Jimmy talking in the background. Um, uh, and... And you just, I do. I've been. I've been trying to capture these little profile shots like this. Like I, I kind of really dig this sort of stuff here, where you can get a sense for just how regular these shapes are. Like this inside radius doesn't change, and this is this is. Let's just let's just call it extremely challenging to try and achieve using hand tools. And of course, the tools in the Fourth Dynasty, you have a number of problems. You know, it's pounding stones, it's flint chisels. And also, what you, the other thing you, I like to point out to people when we're looking at granite from the Old Kingdom is that, and this is also the orthodox opinion that's not generally talked about, is that, uh, is, that, is that they don't attribute Old Kingdom Egyptians with the ability to quarry granite, right? So they did say they didn't have the ability in the Old Kingdom to quarry granite. That, that, they say that came later. Now, look at the site, like, the chunks of mica and horn blend, like these huge crystal inclusions in this stone from where it's broken off here. I mean, this is massive granite. Like, this is very well-formed granite that doesn't come from... You don't get this type of granite with these large pieces of its of its component uh, elements. You don't get this in surface granite, which is what they say 
all of this granite, all of the granite of the old kingdom, the big 70-ton blocks, all of the obelisks, that, there is there were granite obelisks, all of the columns and pillars and blocks and all of the casing stones, you know, the, the, the Menkara pyramid, the middle pyramid with its granite courses, all apparently came from surface granite, which is nonsense, and pieces that were laying around. It's, it's utter nonsense. This stuff comes from the core of granite mountains. Now, obviously, they had the ability to quarry granite, um, but it's a, it's a, it's kind of one of those paradoxes in the in the mainstream story. One of the big contradictions and problems in it. They can't really attribute them with the ability to quarry granite, but look at the evidence of what they. If this was them, then they were certainly able to do it. Service tech. To anyone who uses aim assist in modern warfare, you have no history on this planet. I hundred percent agree. Uh, let's keep going here. Very old and mysterious, yeah. and it's gone. And this could not be attributed. And it's not geopolymer. 100% not geopolitical. That That's right. Archaeologists it wasn't pulverizing for them. No. Yeah, no, yeah. That's not how granite you works. Have national Project, yo. Which is the answer. So the National Project, yo, is the answer that you get. So when, when faced with any questions about the significant levels of technology that are represented by, say, the Great Pyramid, or pieces of stone like this. The answer that I've got, and I've and I've had this answer from Zahi Huas himself, is that it was a national project. That's the answer. It's saying, well, no, they just really wanted to do it well. They really wanted it. They wanted the project. They did it well. And that's just that's the that's the answer you get. It it doesn't. It just dismisses only the technological claims out of hand, which is which is not an it's not an argument, right? It's not an. It doesn't dismiss any of the evidence. It's like saying that, well. You know the the moon missions were a national project, but it's not like they we didn't get there without significant levels of technology. It's not. It wasn't just like well everybody. Get, and I've said this before, but it wasn't just like they get everyone together and we throw some people at the moon. You know, just because everybody was behind the project doesn't mean that you don't have significant technological boundaries and barriers to overcome, as evidenced by this work here that we see. Yeah, everyone was all in. A CCC project. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, we're not going to be arguing oh, about the ge about know. about geopolymer not in here. It's not. If you want to see my stance on geopolymer, go watch the video about the most precise object in Egypt. I lay it out then. I'm not going to get into it now. It's not geopolymer. That's a very silly theory. That's it. <laughs> um, and you can see it in any. Also, just look any piece. There's tons of this granite that has veins of other material in it. You, you can tell it's not geopolymer. I mean, we have goddamn quarries. Yeah. I mean, it, none of the, the, the granite geopolymer idea is the stupidest thing that I've heard in some time. And so this this part is also up at the Giza Plateau. So this is kind of to the right of the Valley Temple. This is at the what they call the the Sphinx Temple. Now it's all sealed off. You can see the Sphinx in the background, but it's very similar to the Valley Temple. It's it's massive blocks of limestone, and it was most likely also all cased in granite. Uh, so you can listen to Yusuf talk about, but there's a couple of these cornice blocks out the front here. And again, notice the style, right? This dry, dry fitted, huge blocks of limestone, very heavy erosion. Old Kingdom, now yeah? Fourth Dynasty. And there's the foundation stuff. I mean, yeah, must have been like holding something. Trying to read the chat. Yeah. Mark Chandos, Mark, good to see you again, mate. Mark was on. He's the last two years. Mark's been with us in Egypt. He's, uh, he's. In fact, Mark, you'll be in some of this footage. We came here to recycle. Yeah. Most of the what survives used to survive under the rubble from the other quarry. Uh, from yeah. the other quarry. Yeah. Sean, you too, man. Good to see you, buddy. They welded this. You back from Turkey? God, huh? there's no one, no one getting into it now. I have a so, torch in my bag. I got one too. <laughs> I did. Kyle was saying he has a torch. I think he was talking about an oxyacetylene torch because that gate is actually welded shut. Like that, that gate to the Sphinx Temple there, welded shut. No, not like a lock and key. It's welded shut. Now, not many people come down here. Everyone like goes straight to the Valley Temple. But if you're ever here, come down here because <laughs> there's a couple blocks here that are really interesting. They're probably the best preserved cornice blocks. They're right here. These are the pieces that used to form the top of the temple. We can call it a cornice. Cornice. Yeah. On top of the casing stone, it's upside down, of course. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. And this is the famous pieces, according to 
Christopher Dunn, the engineer, he labeled those as the smoking guns he saw in these, the yeah. ultimate evidence of ancient Everyone, every time I bring up that moon um, also, moon mission analogy, everyone gets all worked up. Some people are like, we didn't go to the moon. The like, just take it for the example that it is. What we know as the standing for the sake of argument, no, assume we win. And then just consider like the, the national project analogy. That's the actual point of that of that whole thing. It is a snake, yes. The snakes will show up here. Some of the footage some of the footage is from the last couple of years as well. I'm trying to I'm trying to demonstrate we're looking at old kingdom architecture and, and the, the punchline is coming with this, right? This is I mean, we're gonna make a point, but I wanted to show you some of the best examples. And pretty much we're gonna look at all of the cornice blocks and these curved complex shapes that are just awesome. Um <laughs> People just leaning on the caps. I love it. Have you heard of the Adam's Adam and Eve event? Yes. Uh, I've heard, I think you're talking about the Adam and Eve story, the whole pole shift thing. I've heard of it. Yes. And Mark Mc, uh, this I know this is going to echo. Thank but you very much, play it anyway. You're a gentleman and a scholar. And, a scholar. and uh, Mark McDaniel, thank you for the twenty bucks. Have I heard of the Adam's event? Forty-two thousand years ago, the pole shift, um, megalithic damage. So I think. It's a good question. Uh, I don't know specifically about that event. I don't know if it, it is also whether it's the, the Thomas Chan thing or not, um, which I'm familiar with. But um, I think when we look at the damage on these sites, you've got, I think you, you definitely have in some places stuff that's very likely could be catac cataclysmic related. But I think there's also been a lot of damage done by the hands of men. Like, because some stuff is still standing. Like, places like Karnak and other places, like, there's some stuff is still standing. If it was a cataclysm that knocked a lot of that over, then then it wouldn't all be standing. Like, the, the stuff that's standing wouldn't be standing. And some of the tr truly gigantic things you'd think might still be standing, I think a lot of that stuff was pulled down by men and destroyed. Uh, religious zealotry, call it, what it whatever it is, quarrying, they were taking the stone and using it, stuff like that. Uh, you got to remember there's been thousands and thousands of years of that type of activity going on on these sites. So it, it, it kind of becomes hard to tell whether like, well, was this damage caused by cataclysm or was it caused by men? I think more more than we think, more than a lot of people would realize has been caused by the hands of men. Even if we don't know fully why it was, why, how did they use it? For these blocks, they, so these would have been at the top level, probably above the casing stones. These would have been on the roof. Like this would have lined the top, the top level of the... Um, they would have run all the way along the Valley Temple, probably the Sphinx Temple too, and very likely the temple at the top of the causeway or the structure. People call it the Mortuary Temple, but it's the structure, uh, which we'll look at here in a second. So this is this is this is these are the blocks that you see up at the Mortuary Temple. So the Valley Temple sits at the bottom of the causeway. This is all part of the middle pyramid complex, and then. You know, at the at the other end of the causeway, and bear in mind, on the causeway, you've got the Osiris shaft. You've got all these deep shafts that run down it. The causeway itself was all lined in limestone, and then at the top of the causeway, you in front of the pyramid, there is is a structure known as the Mortuary Temple. It's very similar uh, to the Valley Temple. It has a bunch of objects like this. Uh, in fact, it shows almost heavier erosion, like even worse erosion. I think possibly because it was it was kept uh, it was probably more out of the sand than the Valley Temple was, but you have these I call these the couch blocks. And what's interesting about these is they're kind of the end pieces, right? Those cornices we saw before they didn't they didn't have the end to them. Where, where this has this end piece to it, and you'll see more of it here, which means you can't you know you're not there's no saw that's getting in there to make these cuts like these cuts through here. You, you know, you're blocked. But there's no drag saw or anything can get in there to make those cuts because you've got this end piece and you have to make this sort of complex inner radius. Peter Shell, thank you so much for uh, joining the channel membership, mate. Cheers. Um, can I give these times of these live streams and UTC as clocks around the world change twice a year on channels viewed in? Yeah, fair enough. I will do that next time. I just live in PST, so... Uh, the foundation is more curious than any little pebble stack on it. Wait for, hold that thought, hold that thought. But yeah, we, we I can't talk about everything at once. We, I'm not really going to get into the foundation today. I have some videos about um, about the foundation, particularly that of the middle pyramid. Uh, check that out if if you haven't seen it. Um, there's a video about the, the specifically about the foundations of the middle pyramid complex because it's it's crazy. 
Um, but you can see here, again, uh, you have this complex sort of sh com compound curved surfaces, right? You have consistent curves here. Um, and then it stops and you have the ends of these of these blocks. That's what these blocks yeah, are. Yeah, it's one of the first things I've seen. The first video I remember seeing when I revisited, when I was this Jimmy. looking into this stuff again, it was 2015, I was at home, and uh, it was a video of Yusuf and Brian at the Serapium. Such a smooth curve. It's just, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. Decky 69, five bucks. It's incredible. I want to know what, where, how, and most importantly, when. Yeah, you and me both, mate. Um, maybe one day, you know. I don't know. I, I, I don't think the, the, the mainstream explanation for this stuff fits uh, the evidence that we see. It's here. Yeah, yeah. And Thank you so much uh, for the five bucks. Very difficult. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a consistent, smooth radius. And it's this. an inside corner. And the one that Chris Dunn measured up was... I think it was one of these, result. yeah. And it was like this, only it hadn't been yeah, and you get I like these profile shots shooting side. down the... Uh, so the we'll, we'll see one of those blocks. We'll go down to the, the <laughs> Valley Temple. Well, bronze isn't going to do much to this. It would have been if people, I mean, the copper chisel thing is a meme. Uh, bronze isn't going to do anything to this sort of stone. If, if the chisels that will affect granite are things like flint chisels and the dolerite pounders. So nothing is going to give you that effect. No, I mean, this is... No wishful thinking is going to make something like this happen. See this? It's just so beautiful. Like when you get down and you look at it from these angles, like I just, it's, it's hard not to, to, to come to the conclusion that this has been machined. Um, and this is in fact the conclusion that experts like Chris Dunn come to. And as we'll get into uh, on this most recent trip, this is, we'll, we'll come to it a bit later on. Uh, I ha we had a very famous uh, stone carver with us. I didn't know who he was. I had to look him up afterwards, but in the art world, it's someone that has been working in stone for more than 30, 35 years, uh, both hand tools, machine tools, and then later on robotics because uh, he developed carpal tunnel really badly. But his work is collected by billionaires, Mark Zuckerberg, guys like that. He's had profiles written on him in the New York Times. Very well, very famous artist, sort of an eclectic, uh, elusive artist that came on, the, that just for some reason came on the trip with us Um just recently and his opinions on some of the stuff was was very interesting so like, like a true expert someone who has worked in this material hard stone uh with all types of tools like hand tools where you're hammering at it machine tools cutting at it with power tools and then also with robotics and you know cnc lathes and things so some very interesting um observations and in, i'm making a video about one of them in particular but we'll get to that topic at the end here <laughs> no, this is surrogacy. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, no was, wishful thinking. It was all wishful thinking. Thank you very, very much, much, sir. sir. Consistent. You're a gentleman, gentleman and a scholar. And a scholar. Surrogacy. Have you heard you've been debunked? There is a guy who literally pulled your words out of context and debunked them. I left a comment pointing to his fraud under that video, but didn't bother to answer. Uh, yeah, that's typically what happens. I've, I know people like to make videos about me. It's fine. Uh, they're free to do what they want. Uh, but it's generally a massive misrepresentation of what I say. It's, and I just, I'm not. I'm not in the, I, I, I kind of despise the, the drama model on YouTube, the, the negative reaction model. Some people have entire YouTube careers built on doing nothing but creating reaction videos and trying to knock down other people's content. More power to them, they can do it, but I don't have to participate in it. Uh, and I've, I've yet to see any actual valid critiques that aren't just a collection of logical fallacies. But yes, thank you so much for the 30 bucks, Sergacy. I appreciate it, man. It's good to see you. Decky69, again, another five bucks. Cutting copper with cutting granite with copper would be like carving wood with wood. It's ridiculous. We'd be carving wood with chalk. Um, but the idea is obviously the copper chisels. The whole hammering on it isn't going to work. But uh, the theory that they offer up is things like drag saws and you know tubular copper tubes that they would then grind sand into. And there's been some experiments done on that. You know I've covered it in detail in my videos. It doesn't. The results you get from that don't look at at all anything like the ancient results and 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 tool marks that we see it's one of the big problems with the whole thing um and yeah well, it's just go. a very consistent curve like it's, it's yeah it's, yeah they just, to, to holy crap shape what the hell what the hell peter shell peter shell 216 dollars man thank you so much that's extremely generous thank that's, you very um, much sir and apologies for the echoes and a scholar. But, uh, dude, that is extremely generous. Thank you so much for that. It's much, much appreciated, Peter. 
uh, and this is great stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. Well, thank you so much. That's that's uh, that's that's that's, that's over the top. But thank you so much for the um, all that support, mate. Yeah, it's a CAD, it's a 3D CAD thing, right? So yeah, we're talking about the fact that we carve these with CNC machines. 3D printing. This, this, yeah. You wouldn't do this by hand. This is a 3D. Now. This is a 3D uh, CNC machine. This is. Yeah. It's a lathe. It's like a 3D lathe. You know, the 3D mill, whatever you call them, the CNCs. This ancient. Uh, yeah. What's like the name Peter with a video uh, stop. Indeed, yes. You could stop here and yeah. talk about that for like, a while. Well, thank you, mate. Massive, massively appreciated. So, so they're, they're the, those are the cornice blocks. Yep. Yeah? So again, old kingdom architecture. The punchline's still coming with this. Um, we'll get there. But the other part I wanted to talk about here, so this is this is the this is a little video showing kind of showing around the what they call the mortuary temple, right? This this is the other structure like the valley temple that was cased in granite. You can see a big chunk of granite right here, and it has those cornice blocks up on top of it, more granite, and you see the same thing that we saw at the valley temple. You see huge limestone blocks that are very heavily eroded. Right. So again, this is characteristics of some of the, what they would call this megalithic old kingdom architecture, and something to to note here is, and this is kind of when we talked about the foundation. Recently, Yusuf and I found what we think is probably the biggest single block uh, on the plateau in this structure. It's it's actually on the other side of this, and I I think I have a video somewhere where we talk about it, but I'll just tell you. Uh, I, I didn't find the video in time for this, but I can talk about it. And, and we sort of paste it off and you, you do it conservatively. And there's a, there's like a density of limestone. You know, I can't quite remember what it is. It's, I know granite's 175 pounds per square foot. And then, you know, limestone's less than that, this limestone from here. But there's a density figure that you can work out when you we calculate the size of the blocks in cubic meters. And the block itself... It goes into the ground, and you can measure how far down it is, and you can measure the the width and the and the length of it by walking it off. And it's more than it's like three hundred and thirty tons, three hundred and thirty tons of a single block of limestone that's in this structure. And Yusuf hadn't known about it until like I think it was last year we figured it out and we pasted it off. And we went, this is actually the biggest block uh, up here that we know of, and even bigger than some of the floor tiles, which are at the one hundred and fifty two hundred ton range. So just a tremendously massive eroded block of limestone for some reason they moved this 300 ton block up there mark mcdaniel five bucks thank you very much for the logical and scientific approach thank you for the super chat mark cheers um one thing i do I like to point out here as well while we're going through this you can see again the tremendous degree uh, erosional rates here uh you can also see the modern repairs now this stuff you see this stuff here let me go 100 percent here and we'll move it over um Whoops, that's not what we want, this one. So this, we're just above Yusuf's arm here. You see this? A lot of people point to this and go, see, it's it's clearly geopolymer because it's it's morphed in to the rock. It's like they pasted this in here. And they're correct. It's concrete. It's modern concrete. Like this is, this is a modern repair. A lot of the people that argue for geopolymer in the limestone structures often show what is what are modern repairs. This is modern repair work. They, they they concrete this up and they shore it up and then they paint it and try and make it look like limestone. Like this is how they imitate stuff. This is this is very common, but they use concrete to do it. And you see this all over the place. And in a lot of cases, this modern repair work gets gets mistaken for like ancient geopolymer and that, that's not what it is. Um, you see this all over the place. There's a lot of this type of repair work that's done because these structures are falling apart. And in fact, erosion has caused some of this structure to actually fall apart. You have some of these, you know, these huge wave-shaped erosional features on these stacked blocks that have actually caused them to, to fall over. Um, but yeah, this so this, again, people don't spend a lot of time looking at this. They kind of look at the pyramid. Uh, but this is very much a structure worth worth investigating when you're up here and it, because it has some of the largest blocks even bigger than the uh the uh, valley temple the floor is also really interesting here there are there's infrastructure of channeled blocks there's those u-shaped blocks that run beneath the floor level um there's the white calcite blocks there's there's different types of stone as you get on a lot of the old kingdom sites you have a combination of usually it's basalt granite limestone and white calcite are used in their um 
could be 13,000 years of erosion. could be longer. We don't know. It uh, could be just wind and sand. So keep that erosion point in mind, the punchline. We're nearly there. And we're nearly at the, the my point that I want to make about all this stuff, right? Uh, again, we're looking at Old Kingdom architecture. Sean, 90 to 20 bucks. Sean, Ben, here's for a few stellars. Sean, mate. Cheers. Good to hear from you. Sean was um, on the Egypt trip with us just recently and uh and uh then was on a, on a like a long journey through turkey but yeah cheers mate thanks so much for the 20 bucks and hopefully we'll get to have some stellas again in the future stellas being the the probably a good local egyptian beer user 9879 is that euros thanks man thanks uh thanks so much for the five uh super chat i appreciate it <clears throat> so yeah this sits out the front of the what they would call the I guess Kafra's pyramid, the middle pyramid is the the term I like to use for it. Now, here's the punchline. And before we get there, another quick look at the Valley Temple, the blocks, the blocks. One other element that I want to share here that is not often seen by people uh, in the side of the Valley Temple. So as you, this is kind of at the back, the Sphinx is over here on the left of this. You kind of walk down, this is the exit route people take out. Uh, what you see inside the Valley Temple here is kind of interesting. There's a a quite well-made um, granite channelized block, a U-shaped block. And above this, it's broken off. And then above this is the only piece of quartzite. Like a quartzite's like a form of compressed sandstone. You can see it has actually a, a buildup of calcium or something on it. So there was another block in front of it. And where this goes, and some people think, well, this is drainage for water. But inside the Valley Temple itself, like this is way above your head. It pops out or where it is is way above your head. You're... You're actually at higher level than you would be standing in the Valley Temple. So drainage doesn't make any sense. Um, I think it's indicative of some form of infrastructure that was maybe part of the purpose of these of these um, sites and these structures originally because you see this sort of block at the other end of the causeway, up at the other end at the Mortuary Temple. You see at Abu Sir, it's completely riddled with these blocks. It runs all the way underneath the causeway and always it's it's beneath the, the, the floor level, like beneath the tiling stones. You know, it's beneath, you know, a foot of, of actual stone. And you make it from granite, or in some cases, at Saqqara, you see it too. It's made from uh, white calcite, very well made, like polished stone. Like, it's, it's an expensive type of stone. There has to be a purpose to it because it's hidden. A lot of the times, that the, the mainstream Egyptologists will tell you they use things like white calcite for its, its color because it was visible and it was used as a ceremonial purpose or it represented something, but... You know, how come they're using those types of stones, but it's it's hidden from view? It's underneath the floor tiles. It just doesn't make uh, it doesn't make any sense. So, um, the original color of the second pyramid. Uh, so the the bottom two courses were were cased in granite, and then the, the rest of it was that fine white Tura limestone. Um, you never take anything for granite. Nice. Anyway, um, so that's. Just an interesting feature in the Valley Temple. Now, here's 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 the point I want to make. Okay, so everything like that, like that megalithic stuff, right? We built big in megalithic work. We built that way to to uh, so it wouldn't fall down in earthquakes. You know what else comes from the fourth dynasty? You know what else is also from that same period? All of this work here, the mud brick stuff is probably later. But look at the look at the wall back here, right? This is all. Old Kingdom Fourth Dynasty architecture. These are Old Kingdom Fourth Dynasty structures, and it's not like they're in a different area. They're right there next to the Valley Temple. They're in Primo Pyramid Complex territory. Uh, Deki sixty nine, another ten bucks, mate. Egyptologists need to let go of the dogma. Maybe as the newer generation takes over, there'll be fresh and new ideas and openness to think outside the dogma. Uh, that is my hope. Um, that is my hope, and I've been contacted by some student uh, archaeologists and Egyptologists that gi that give me. Give me hope in that direction. So you see this? Like this is the same, this is supposedly the same period, the same builders that made all that other stuff we've just been looking at. This is all fourth dynasty in the same area. Uh, same thing, right? How come, how come, and this is, it's not modern. This is, this is fourth dynasty, old kingdom. These are all old kingdom tombs. So you notice a couple of things like it's why isn't it megalithic? Why, why didn't they? Why isn't it made from giant blocks? And it didn't fall down like it's been through earthquakes. It's still here. Like this is earthquake proof. This stuff's still here. 
it doesn't show the same degree of erosion that we see on the on the supposedly same time frame massive megalithic work but this is all from exactly the same time period the same dynasties this apparently the same people and it's made from these smaller blocks now if you can make a wall that valley temple you don't need to make the valley temple from those giant blocks it's it's exponentially harder to make it from those big blocks than it would be to make it from this and if it's just ceremonial and you're going to case it in granite anyway who cares you might as well make it from this stuff and, and save yourself some time and effort but that's not what we see and here's some more examples so this is also old kingdom fourth dynasty this is this is part of the sphinx enclosure wall uh, behind the fence it's good masonry like this is great work it's totally within the capabilities of the primitive tools of di the dynastic egyptians made from limestone all fourth dynasty all the same period doesn't show remotely the same degree of erosion it's been damaged like it's probably been quarried and people have been taking stuff from here but we just don't see the same degree of erosion here um another example another wall another part of so if you you go to giza and you go behind the 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 uh, valley temple and a lot of people just walk up the causeway and go and look at the pyramids if you veer left of that you can get into an area that is all old kingdom fourth dynasty tombs areas it's all we know what old kingdom tombs look like and it's all this sort of structures and it's you know it's in the same place so i just find it very difficult to believe that it's the same people that it's the same dynasties it's the same time frames the same builders it just doesn't make any sense um so this it's like this is the point i was trying to make with this was a comparison of so-called old kingdom architecture you know you you have to swallow the pill and accept that all right if you think that that, that all happened in the fourth dynasty then the, it was the same people that made this they did this it was the same people and just doesn't it does not make any sense decky it's a government project that what you get for the lowest bidder maybe but this ain't you know this you could maybe get away with that if this was in a different area but this is in primo territory this is right on the pyramid complex like this is not an area that you would be going for lowest possible bidder right if you're the pharaoh and you're you're building that structure out and you want it all to be massive and perfect then how come you've got all this stuff on there as well jason m 10 canadian thanks so much jason much appreciated how long have we been going what is the time oh we're nearly an hour i'm, I'm only at the first thing here all right we need to we'll, we'll keep it going here <laughs> So this is a, a structure called, and I really just wanted to continue that point to show you that um, there's a bit more architecture over here, a bit further up the course. This is a structure called Kent Cowis. Uh, it's another pyramid that was is kind of fallen apart. Uh, it does have some megalithic components, particularly in the underground parts of it. This is an area that people often call the Second Sphinx at Giza. Uh, they often show you a picture taken from sort of over this dip down in the corner, kind of looking from behind this and this kind of looks like it could be a head but it's not it was never a sphinx it's just bedrock and it, one of the reasons you don't often see it from this angle is like this is supposed to be the head but then what's all this like this is just you can see how it's just eroded bedrock this doesn't make it this this bit here this whole bit here doesn't make sense if this was a sphinx um i don't think this was a second sphinx at all but my point being here is is really this section here uh we go to 100 percent here where um again all old kingdom work this is not repairs this isn't like late new kingdom whatever old kingdom masonry and repair and some of this stuff on tops modern repair work but you can see the old kingdom work here it's great like it's very good and it's still there and you know it survived all the earthquakes and it's just i i'm the more you you kind of look at the i guess the inferior type of work and this is something i've been focusing a lot lately uh, the more you start to see the paradox between the, the two different industries. And, I, and the last video I, was, I did, we really focused in on that. It was, I think we see this tale of two industries. We see stuff that is explainable with the primitive tools and techniques in the archaeological record. And then you have a category of stuff that isn't. And we see this in architecture. We see it in the statues. We see it in the boxes. We see it in the columns. You know, and we see it in the... the uh, um what else like just just in 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 the in the bowls and in the other small artifacts you see a tale of two industries across all of those categories and all that work in egypt there's stuff that you can explain with the primitive tools and technologies that we know the dynastic egyptians use and then there's stuff you can't 
and it's like it just starts to become clearer so in it's i've you know i've always focused on the the best stuff and the more inexplicable stuff but lately i've been trying to capture more of the i guess the other other side of the coin like the um the the stuff that is clearly done by dynastic egypt using relatively primitive tools and techniques the kin- the kinky creeper <laughs> nice name uh yeah you can uh you can scroll it back it's, it'll be on my channel. I'm not. This will be on there. Um, Kent Cowis is crooked compared to everything on the plateau. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting. Um, it's an interesting spot. Maybe one day I'll talk a bit more about it. I've had some experience with it. Any news about the labyrinth, or is it just going to rot away in salt water with the SEK 2000 Johan? Thank you so much. Um, and Mark Bass, thank you for the five. Uh, the labyrinth. So I've been. I've actually been in touch with. Uh, I think it's Louis de Cordier, the guy who ran the Matahar expedition. He started up on Instagram. We swapped some messages. He's still lobbying for support. I think that's where it's at. They they did try and put a proposal in uh, to the antiquities department a couple of years back to start work on the restoration project. But as as far as I know, they never received a response. So that's where that's at, as best as I know. Um. So one question from a patron came up that said, and I just I'm just going to play these through the Sphinx here. Uh, he he said, "Well, do you not think, or why don't you think that the Sphinx enclosure was also cased in granite?" Uh, and so it's a good question because this sits this the Sphinx here sits right you know behind the Sphinx Temple, and then you've got the Valley Temple too. Uh, and I don't believe it was cased in granite. Nobody's ever really presented much evidence that it was cased in granite. It may have been cased in granite. I don't think it was because there's very little granite laying around. And even if, even after quarrying and things like that, and bear in mind that this would have been buried in sand for most of those, there would have been a lot more accessible granite to get at uh, for quarrying uh, purposes. Holy crap. Um, but there is still a little bit of granite laying around here. Uh, so this is, this is looking at the back end of the, of the, um, the Sphinx Temple, Crooker, mate. Thank you so much for the nine months being uh, being in the an exec producer in the uh, channel members. Much appreciated. Off topic, twenty bucks. Love visiting Egypt and been fascinated by your channel. I know religious nuts claim this ad nauseum, but ancient scripture revered by revered, revered by Muslims, Jews, and Christians does have irrational stuff to add. Just saying, it does. Yeah, I don't I don't debate I don't dispute that. I think there's a grain of truth in a lot of religious stories. Uh, in fact, I have a whole video talking about it um but thank you so much for the 20. all right so again looking at the back of the um the sphinx temple and i just wanted to point out that yes there's some granite laying around inside the the sphinx enclosure these pictures are from i think 2015 when i was in there with zahi Hawass. and uh but in general you know, there's a couple couple pieces laying around i don't know if this was ever cased in granite it doesn't see and you don't see when you look at like the if you go back a couple of pictures look at this stuff you see, you see it's indented you see all these square shapes and everything this is this was shaped for the granite like this was how they attached that granite and kind of locked it in in three dimensions it wasn't just flat and you just don't see any of that um on the enclosure walls in the sphinx right this is the vertical fissures and the rainfall erosion that not this part the horizontal parts the vertical fissures that that robert shock talks about it you know being rainfall erosion but you don't see the same sort of shapes in the limestone uh that would have taken granite casing stones is one of the other reasons there's a younger me in front of the uh the sphinx i'll point this out too a lot of because i get this question frequently or some people bring it up they're like what is this thing underneath the sphinx's ear it's like a, a switch to open a doorway or something no this was this is where they attached the beard so they, they carved this shape in here and was, i think it was an old kingdom or as an Egyptian renovation, but they put a beard on it. And parts of the beard are still in the museum, but this is how they kind of put that piece of stone in there. They locked it in uh, with this. You don't believe in radar? Because I don't need you. That's right. I wish, I wish my soundboard wasn't echoing. We'd be playing with it a lot more. You have no shop, because I have no shop. Could they have Could no shop? shop? That's right. <laughs> this is uh, Zahi's security guard right here. Anyway, so that's I just wanted to address that because it was a question from a patron, and uh, we're moving on now. Moving on. Okay, so the next thing 
Next topic out of five, and we've been at an hour on the first one, so I'll try and speed this up a bit, uh, is the quarry in Aswan, right? So check this out. We went up to the granite quarry. This is, this is you know, the unfinished obelisk, but this is a different area of the quarry that I'd never been to, and I don't think even Yusuf had been to, and he's probably been there a hundred times. But for some reason, um, we just walked down in here, and they didn't care. I was like, okay. So, and then I walked down there and the whole group came down. It's like, fine. We just took our time. Not hurting anything. But this is generally an area that's off limits in the quarry. For some reason, they let us down in here. You, When you watch the indoctrination video, when you sit in there at the in the little hot room, they make you watch this video before you go out into the quarry and they tell you how it all worked. They describe this area as the harbor. This is where they would flood and they would bring in a barge or they would bring in a boat to take the, you know, the giant obelisk. And we'll, we'll, we'll debunk that in a minute. But this is that area, right? So there's a bit of audio coming up here too. But So we're standing down in it, and you can see it's all shaped by these scoop marks, the same scoop marks that we see uh, on the obelisk and all the other areas. And the other thing you see here are these ostriches, right? They show you these when they talk about... Um, they talk about it in the, in the little video, but it's this red ochre ostriches and artwork. Now, the interesting thing about this stuff there's also you know these little like almost petroglyph like symbols here uh let's have a look a little closer look um 100 all right see these things there's a there's grid lines and you have these little figures and then you have a whole collection of what it what are supposed to be i think ostriches uh birds obviously the interesting thing about all of this this artwork, and it's not something that you hear in that indoctrination video, is that this artwork is very, very similar. In fact, it matches precisely much of the artwork they found in pre-dynastic artwork, pre-dynastic objects, pre-dynastic burials, archaic age, stuff that goes back to like 15,000 years. You know, they, they, they've they found, they have burials. There was obviously a long pre-dynastic, end of the Stone Age kind of era uh, period, and this artwork matches that. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing to say because obviously this stuff had to be carved out before someone could come along and paint some artwork on it, right? They're flamingos, not actually, who knows what they are? They're birds. But the point is it's the style of artwork. And you can see the scoop mark. You have this tremendous ch channel. Like this, I think what's happened here is there is a gigantic piece of stone quarried out of here. Like a huge piece of stone, like much deeper than where the obelisk is. In this, this, we're in a trench that once contained a massive piece of stone. And here's the, as you can see, this is above Steve's head here, the straight line of the unfinished obelisk, right? This is, so we're down in the lowest part of the quarry. And uh, there's a bit of audio coming up here. And then you can see there's all up these scoop marks. We spin right around, we're back to the ostriches, the artwork. 100% uh, pre-dynastic, uh, matches pre-dynastic artwork. Andy Stein, 10 bucks. Is it possible that Egyptians face pressure from religious institutions to suppress evidence for ancient technology? Rewriting history and debunking. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't think so, would be my feeling. I don't think so. It's not like, not like the history of Islam's kind of tied up with ancient Egypt. Deki, off topic, Younger Dry, Saginaw Bay, Impact Theory, Carolina Basin, Nebraska, Rainwater Basins, Magnetic Reversal News did a great video. Okay, thank you. And Decky, what are your th ideas and thoughts about what the scoop marks are? Mate, I have a whole video about it. Uh, check out my scoop marks video. I don't know what it is, I think it, I, but I believe it's some form of, of pretty advanced machining and tools like that we don't have. Could have been ultrasonic, could have been a, a bunch of different possibilities, stuff that we don't understand potentially, but stuff that is likely outside of our current technological reach maybe i don't know whatever it seems like it seems like they were definitely able to remove stone real easily uh, much more easily than we can do it uh, and it certainly isn't the result of pounding stones which is an argument i get into in, in depth in that in that scoop marks video so you used to see like the, the grid marks on the back here very interesting and on these pieces that have fallen off um this is odd this is odd here and then look at the bottom here the shapes on the floor like see this these indents. Right, so these are the scoops. Yeah, yeah. This is where we will be walking. 
and this is the other part that that moved under the obelisk. So it oh, would yeah. be somewhere around between here and, and the there. and the <coughs> other side. So it's like five meters. Uh, five yeah, meters tall, probably. Huge. Yeah. And whatever it could be, this could be the base for a statue, one of those giant. So statues. yeah, I, I think this could have been, could have been a a block for one of the massive single piece statues, one of the really big colossal statues. Uh, something that's five meters deep, and it, this is this is bigger. It may not be long. I don't know how long it is, but it's it's much bigger than the unfinished obelisk. Like this shape, this could be a block is one of the giant is crazy. Yusuf thinks it might have been. See how long this is? Like this is. Look out! Look how long this is, and how deep this is. And this is. This may well have been one piece that was quarried out of here. Yeah. Oh, true. Yeah. Yusuf thinks it could have been an obelisk. This is Abu Ghraib. Yeah. Maybe according to the official story. Can you guys hear what he's saying? I'll turn this up a bit more. Listen to this. It's kind of interesting. He he makes a point about the obelisks here, and I'll reinforce it when he's done. This is Abu Ghraib. Yeah. Maybe, uh, according to the official story, at least they mentioned that that obelisks are not since the old kingdom, so they existed. Because I was actually talking about that online, and some dude came and said like, "Oh, yeah, obelisks were exclusively new kingdoms." So I said, "Okay, nah. go back to the box and keep reading." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even get the official story right. See what he said? He he said that <clears throat> someone came and said to him that, "Oh no, obelisks are exclusively new kingdom structures." And I'm like, "Go back to that's actually not even what the official story says." Like, go back to the he says, "You know, go back to the books and keep reading," because Abu Ghraib was supposedly the base for one of the biggest obelisks ever made and that's that's fifth dynasty supposedly so the obelisks have been around for a long time like they're not just a new kingdom structure they're on they're on a lot of new kingdom sites that are attributed to new kingdoms but those sites themselves go back into prehistory and old kingdom think places like karnak luxor tanis they all have roots that stretch way back and in fact i i on my list, as soon as I get back from this next trip, I'm going to be doing a video about Karnak, a long video, because I think there's very, very strong evidence that there's been a, a pre-existing structure that's been rebuilt. It was likely much older. Uh, and I think a lot of the granite stuff that we see, both there and Luxor, you could kind of treat them both the same, uh, have these pre-existing granite structures that were essentially rebuilt in the New Kingdom using sandstone uh, by Ramses. Almost, yeah. Like definitely primitive, right? It's like prehistory. So yeah, later on when we got down here, Yusuf was astounded that we got down here to look at this. This is insane, this here. This this the scoop marks here are really awesome. Yeah. Well just this whole wall's been scooped out, like Yeah, giant statues at Karnak, giant statues at Tanis, at Luxor. They're all over the place. I will show you I'll show you a little bit of one coming up here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he says, I always I like started. to play the, play the dumb tourist sometimes. So yeah, whatever they put in. So here's the other point that I like to make about this. So you've got a sense of now how wide this channel is, right? This, this supposed harbour. <clears throat> Let me just say this. Not even close to being big enough to, for, to, to get a boat in here that might support the weight of something like the unfinished obelisk or anything even close to it. Not, even, not in a million years could you get something in here that could support it. To give you an example... The Russian Thunderstone, when they move that, and I talk about that in, in the quarrying and logistics video. Look at these scoop marks. They're just linear. I love it. There's also dolphins on these walls, uh, and I've got some pictures of them. You can barely see them, uh, but there's also dolphins in like a black paint shown here. Beautiful linear scoop marks. And again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have these ridges that are consistently in a straight line if you were pounding. It's just not what would you would end up with. Uh so with the Thunderstone, the Thunderstone was about 1,500 tons. They moved it from Norway across the or Finland, I think, across the sea to Russia, and then shipped and then you know used used tracks to like and capstans to slowly drag it 100 meters a day on like a rail system. But when they when they took it across the ocean, they had to build a giant barge, very large barge, very wide, uh, to take the weight of it, and then they put warships on either side of it, so they would stabilize it with like a series of three or four big huge galleys and warships on either side of this barge just to stop it from tipping and that's that's the size of the thing that they needed to carry like a 1500 ton load which is in the range of what that obelisk would have been at 1200 tons and this is a narrow channel you, you put you put that obelisk on a on a 
boat that only fits in this narrow channel with a bit of water in it, it's just going to go... It's, it's either going to just put crush the whole thing down to the ground, into the water, like on and crush crush it, or it's going to just tip it over on the side and just just smash it and, and fall on into the ground here. Like There's no way you get a boat or any sort of ship in here to carry a load like that or even anything close to it. It's just not how that stuff works. You can see how narrow it is here. Like This is what they said they'd fit something in that was this narrow to take the obelisk, which is almost this wide. Like the obelisk is what two-thirds the width of this channel and i think what we're looking at here is not you know it's not like a quarry that was dug out this is this is the this is a, a single piece that was removed from the quarry <laughs> it's absolutely nuts so yeah all right a little closer up image of the uh the artwork again the point here is is that this matches uh pre-dynastic artwork this is very much in a archaic age style stuff that happened long before the dynastic civilization ever arose which means that this wall and these scoop marks and this work was done before that as well. Mind your head, workmatic, thank you. Now, here's the dolphins. Can you see them? Like very faint dolphins. Also very sort of primitive looking uh, shapes. You can see one here, right? This is supposedly dolphins. You see the fins? Dolphins or sharks or something, a smaller one here, like a baby one. But these are also painted on this wall here. Um uh, but yeah, really cool. Hadn't been down, never been down in this area, so it was very interesting getting down in here. You drew those. And then the other thing that was also real interesting to Yusuf and I was this grid system. I don't think anyone's ever really documented this this grid system. Maybe they were planning on drawing some more stuff and this was like their background, like they were just trying to, you know, keep it in in uh in the correct size. Um but the the grid system is interesting. And then there, on the other side, you also had these weird channels. Now, maybe this was a way they were scooping underneath the stone or getting underneath this block or something like this. But these these little... This is very strange to me. I don't quite know what it is. Um, you also do see here some pulverized granite, which is... You might get that as a result of using fire. Now, a lot of people will say, well, there was the quarrying... The way they did this with pounding stones, they would set fires and then they would pound on them. And you just the problem is we don't see the result of it. You would see a lot more broken up granite because the fires will break up that surface layer of granite. Um, this may this may or may not be the result of that. You'd see this everywhere though if they used fires everywhere. You don't see it everywhere. Uh, and you see like the the surface fracturing and cracks. It doesn't necessarily have to come apart. But I don't know what this, what this is from. This could be from any number of things. But yeah, it's it's just reminded me of like the whole like oh they used fire argument. Grid lines possible dimensions for cutting. Could be. Could be. We don't give Flipper the credit he deserves. Yeah. All right. So I, let's see. What is the time? All right. I'm going to skip past this. This was another look at another part of the quarry, but you guys have seen it. Um, it's in my quarrying video. Just It was just like a fresh look at some of the stuff, under, like the scoop marks underneath this unfinished block of, um, of granite. I'm going to move on to something else, which is kind of cool. Uh, next topic, really. And this is this is a really fun one. This is a really good one. Okay, this is this is a lot of fun, so I'll just play it. We're in the descending passage. In we're at, we're at the Great Pyramid now. So back to Giza, into the Great Pyramid, going down the descending passage. Now, one of the things that I had learned of recently, and I want to give a shout out to uh, History for Granite, uh, Edge, who comes into my Twitch streams quite a bit. Uh, he runs that... Um, History for Granite channel. Excellent channel. Go and subscribe to it. His videos get a lot of traction, but he's, I think he should have more subs. Uh, does really good work, in-depth um, research into a lot of the, the little elements that make up things like the pyramids. Uh, very cool channel. He talked about the granite blocks that are, that are part of uh, the Great Pyramid. Now, as we know, right, it's, it's limestone. The blocks of the pyramid are limestone. The casing was limestone. Uh... And, you know, the king's chamber and all of that area and all of the, the, the chambers above it. And it's like 80 of these, 70, 80 of these giant big granite beams. That's all granite. There's a number of other granite blocks that are actually in the Great Pyramid. And some of them are really interesting because they contain tube drills. They've got really deep and lengthy tube drills in them. There's four or five bits of granite that seem to have been part of some infrastructure that was in here. Now, maybe some of them were in 
the portcullis area in front of the king's chamber. Some of them, some of them might have been in uh, in uh, in in this passage, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But I wanted to investigate these pieces of granite, so we're going to go and take a look at some of these pieces of granite. And I got kind of a nice. Uh, I actually got to see a couple bits that that. I don't think a real common knowledge for people. So there's some interesting stuff here. Claustrophobia setting in. Yeah, it's a bit that way. It's a bit of audio here because uh, I just I thought this was funny. So really hoping my wallet didn't fall out somewhere in here. Well, I would have seen it. I started looking for my wallet. I'm like, shit, I don't have my wallet. Uh, it's pretty big, right? Big black wallet. I feel like I, I probably put it in my bag. I think I did. Yeah, Why am I taking a wallet into the pyramid? I don't know. Yeah. I was carrying so much crap on me. Maybe I'll check again. So this is at the bottom of the um, <clears throat> descending passage. We're well and truly into the bedrock here. I'm not gonna. Yeah. We're not gonna watch the entire I thing. The top two. You like the hoodie? I like the hoodie. These hoodies are great. Yan, cheers. So we're coming down to. Um, the entrance to the grotto here. The well shaft. Pete, thank you, man. Cheers. Okay. Lots of lots of rubble and detritus and trash really. The entrance to the grotto. The well shaft. So, vending machine in bottom chamber. There is a, something like that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> down here you get down, and this is this, you know, this passage is, many people know, only deviates like a, a tenth of an inch or something over 100 meters. It's incredibly precise. And then you have this short crawl. For me, it's a crawl on the hands and knees to, to get through this bit to get into the subterranean chamber. But there's a little alcove off to the right-hand side here. And this houses one of those pieces of, um, of granite that I was talking about, um, which we get to look at. Here, let me move it up a bit, which we get to look at. So here it is here. It's in this little alcove. And this is one that doesn't have tube drills in it. This was broken from something and then probably thrown down, this, down the descending passage from, from guys like Cavilia or someone like that may have done it. But it has, it has, a, it has a machine. Like it's worked faces here. It's a big chunk of granite. It has a line in it for some reason. That's, that's, I don't know why it's there, but this is like an, an errant piece of granite that's at the bottom of the descending passageway. And it's sort of set off into this little alcove. You can find historical accounts of this thing. It's probably the least interesting piece of granite, but there's a number of other pieces of granite. Now, as we go in here, um, this is, everyone wonders what this is. This is the, uh, the scan pyramids project stuff. So they're still doing the muon detection, the cosmic ray detection stuff. So they've, they've, and they leave this in here because the only way you can get down into the subterranean chamber is with a special permission. So it's, it, the public can't get down here. You have to have set up the special permission access. Same as all these crates and things over here, uh, in the subterranean chamber. It's all part of that experiment that's going on. Jeremiah is fearing claustrophobic. Yeah, I, I, I feel you there, mate. That's, I don't, actually I don't because I don't really feel that when I'm down here. It's great getting down here and of course in the subterranean chamber is a a pit now interestingly here's another block of granite now we don't know how far this goes really this hasn't ever been really properly excavated there's there's rumors of it connecting up outside and potentially being another entrance into the structure but here we find yet another piece of granite and what's interesting is it actually contains a couple of tube drills uh very well done tube drills Remember, most of the tube drills we see are at Abu Sir and all that sort of stuff, and they're not really associated with the pyramid. And of course, if you're interested in the tube drills, I have I have a whole documentary on them and why they're so uh, interesting and what they represent. Uh, I would check those out if you're interested. But the tube drills to me are a sign of kind of that you know pyramid builder kind of levels of technology, and particularly the the striations and the way they they're shaped. And all of these, for example, a complete tube drill tube drills that should be 100% should be latex molded. We should either scan them or latex mold them and we'll be able to define things like striation lines and penetration rates and stuff. It's kind of crazy to me that the only time we've done that type of work is with Petrie's core number seven 
And that's because the Petrie Museum in London did it. They, they're the ones who created the latex mold of that. And that's led to all of the analysis that Chris Dunn did that talks about the penetration rate into granite and everything, which is, and it's conclusive. Like I've seen people try to dodge their way around that by manipulating photographs and stuff of it. Uh -uh. There's a latex impression where you can literally follow the, um, the, uh, the striations on that thing and define the, uh, the penetration rate into granite, which is remarkable. And so all of these seem to seem to at visual inspection show the same types of characteristics. hundred percent. We should be um, doing latex molds to try and figure these things out. But the authorities and the people that have the power to do those sorts of things don't seem to want to do it. Deep, deep in the depths underneath the Great Pyramid. So there's, there's that block. Now, I happen to also have some video from, and it's not me, just let's make that clear. Uh, this is an in, this is a this is a close up look of those holes in this block at the bottom of the pit, and you can also hear some background noise. It's it's I think it's this is recorded on a phone, so it's picking up more background noise. Uh, gonna have to rewatch only Oscars, yeah, mate. Sorry, I know this is late for some people, but this is a close up look at these holes in this block. So the, as you can see, they're quite deep. And there's some good images of um, of the striations coming up here that we can see in them. They're actually really long. So a lot of these blocks, here's another one. So it's like, it's not often associated with the, with the pyramid. I think a bird just ran into my window. It's not always associated with the pyramid, like these, the things like tube drills, but there, there are, they happen to be all over the place in the Great Pyramid. Um, Of course, it's not the best footage, but it is footage up close that I don't think many people have uh, have seen this. I've not, I've certainly not seen a lot of this type of stuff. And as you can see, it's a nice big block of granite that would, that may or may not have existed down here originally. Um, and here's some images of the of the hole. So you can see the the nice striation lines in them. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Let's have a look. Let's go 100% on that. That's going to make it bigger. Yeah. So there's clearly some some deep grooves in the side of this hole. I, again, it would be a perfect candidate for something like, you know, clear clear it out, clear this this crap out, this sand and stuff out of here, and, and do like a uh, a latex mold for this would uh, would would help a lot, I think. Um. And so there's that's not the only example, right? So we've got the block at the bottom of the passageway that's in that corner that I showed you. There's the block down here in the pit in the subterranean chamber. There's another block in the grotto. This is very tough to see. Um, in fact, there's only like historical accounts of it, but it's like a six, seven hundred pound block of granite that was probably thrown down the well shaft from the Grand Gallery by Cavilia, and it was lodged in the in the the well shaft, and then it fell down and ended up in the grotto. But it apparently also has tube drills in it. And then there's another block of granite that's that's associated with the pyramid, and it's up here. Now this is the this is the main entrance to the Great Pyramid. The down to the right here is Mahmud's Hole, where people go uh, in all the time. But they're also this was literally the photos I took a couple of weeks back. This is the main entrance. You see the chevron blocks here. Uh, let's go a little bigger, so you can see the um, the chevron blocks here, these big ones, right? And then there's the the doorway down below that leads into the descending passageway. Obviously, they put up some scaffolding. They're doing something. I don't know if this is Mark Lane. It might be. Kind of the hat kind of matches Lena. There's some other people here doing some official business, I guess. And then the red shirt crew guys come in. I don't know if they're cleaning. Maybe they're getting ready to drill. Because uh, apparently there's that void just behind these chevrons. Um, a part of that scan pyramids project found a void behind here. I don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> now, on our, I will say that on our uh, recent visit, I came up here. Now, I'm not really supposed to go up here. Um, I got yelled at for going up here, but there's a granite block up here with tube drills in it, and I really wanted to see it. I'd known about it for years, and I wanted to go up here and see it. Now, I don't really consider it really breaking the rules. You've got all these people up here, and in fact, we go back and look at this. There's there's some some lucky lady in a, in a green shirt with a big hats having a nice lunch and a break and a, a view from up here. In 2015, you could walk up here. They, I went up here in 20. You could just. You didn't even need a ticket. You just get on the. You only needed a ticket to go in, at Mahmud's Hole, and you could just walk up here. They built a staircase to go up here. 
people are up here all the time. So, so before, you know, I'm not like going out of bounds or anything. I mean, technically, I'm probably wasn't supposed to go up there, but I really wanted to look at that block. So I went up there. Um, and you see, it was dark. And I wanted to look at this block of granite. Now, <laughs> They're concerned about people trying to climb the pyramid. So eventually, because they saw my torch on here, the, the cops started yelling and our guys, I came back down. But they're more worried about people trying to climb the pyramid. I'm just, as you can see, it's just a staircase. It's It used to be open access up here. So I'm just like justifying me sort of bending the rules a bit to go up here because I really wanted to see this block of granite that's up here. And that's what we're going to look at at the entrance. I don't know they're hiding. I don't know what they're doing. They, they've made this area off limits for, for a few years now. Like I said, in 2015, you could just walk up here. And I did, in 2015, I didn't know about this block of granite. And I, otherwise, I would have taken a closer look. But here we go. So it's a big piece of granite. And you can see it has, again, a really long... And these are, these are like deep tube drills in this blocks of granite, right? And this was apparently lodged in uh, the descending passageway. It has that one, it has two. It may have even a fourth on the broken face in front of us uh, here a little bit closer. And then I, I switched over to my phone uh, just because it seemed to be doing better with like low light. And so again, you see a big tube drill, so evidence of these tube drills. And I'm showing you all this because people don't realize that there was absolutely tube drills associated with the Great Pyramid uh, and the granite that's in there. You don't see these things on the pieces that are in you know, the king's chamber or the granite that's part of that, but there's more granite to the Great Pyramid than just the king's chamber. And all of that other granite has these, seems to show signs of some significantly advanced technology uh, in it. So there you go. And then, so that's the doorway, right? So that's, that's this this right here is the, um, the doorway going into the descending passage. Uh, you can kind of see the lights that are on in there. Um, let's see. Taking a look at the um, the chevron here, I think. Yeah, so this is up the, the ladder a little bit. So this is the chevron where the uh, the void supposedly right behind, just underneath this, there's supposedly a void just back in here. Uh, they've obviously not made a hole or anything just yet. But this is up at the main entrance. Can you teleport 500 feet? All right. And this is like the view. This is the, what that lady having her lunch was viewing. Uh, it's a nice view of Cairo. And then uh, we take another quick look at the block and go downstairs. So you're back down, looking back down into the lights. They, they have fixed the lights. The light, lighting in the subterranean um, passageway is, and is better than it was. And then, yeah, I, <clears throat> this is about where I was getting yelled at because um, they saw my torch and they're like, hey, are you trying to climb the pyramid? I'm like, no, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the granite, yo, you know. Looking at the evidence. <laughs> anyway, I'd love to get another look at it at some point. Hopefully, they open this area up for people to go back up and look at because it's they literally built a staircase to go up here and check it out. So, and it's been there for quite a while. Anyway, so there you go. You used to found any theory regarding the tube, the drill holes. Well, uh. Yusuf pretty much agrees with with Chris Dunn and all of that type of stuff. So I guess I guess watch the the Chris Dunn um, video about tube drills. Well, true code. Looking forward to all your future content. Thanks, man. Cheers. All right, we got a couple more here. Let's see, three more, but we're going to speed through these. All right. So well, uh, the next topic that I want to share with you guys is a little bit about the step pyramid. So we're going, we did on this last trip just go down. We weren't supposed to go down beneath the step pyramid, but everybody in the group wanted to do it. So we organized an extra special permission and everybody ponied up and, and, and we actually got down beneath the step pyramid again, which is really interesting because beneath the step pyramid is this, right? You go down, is a huge shaft that's like 90, 100 feet deep and then this massive granite multi-piece box that's at the bottom of a shaft. This all sits beneath the step pyramid. 35 bucks, man. Thank you so much, Walter Card. I didn't realize that. Looking forward to all my future content. Much appreciated. Just want to stop and say that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you as very well much, Alistair sir. Alistair Campbell with the You're 80s. Gentleman, gentleman and, a scholar. and a scholar. Love your work. I'm hopeful that one day we'll get some clarity in the origin and reason for some of this stuff. And people like you are at the forefront of keeping the momentum going. We're all thankful. Cheers from the UK. 80 pounds. Alistair, thank you so much. It's for the kind words and for the support. Much appreciated, mate. Uh, I'm glad. I, I also am hopeful that we can answer a few of these questions and, and get... Um, 
get used, uh, move it forward. I see a question about what was the drilled block used for? And yet copper tube drills pr produce the exact striations. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't produce anything like it. Go watch my YouTube, go watch my uh, my drill tube, my tube drill video. They don't look, the, the copper, the grinding method doesn't look anything like what we see in these tube drills or on the cores that we get out of them. Not, not even close. That's one of the biggest problems with it. Um, they don't, they're, they're nothing like it. Um, what were they used for? They may have been used for hinges. Um, a lot of these tube drills are used for door hinges. I think they were functional. There's obviously something rotating in there. Uh, in fact, in some of those holes, you can tell that they had something rotating in them for a long time because there's no longer any striation. They're actually worn smooth. In a couple of places, they're actually worn out of round. Um, things like that. Did, what did the ancient builders use for lighting? Very good question. Um, great question to go down in the Serapium and ask because there's no evidence for soot or anything down there. Thank you for the three bucks. Samwise, the mysteriousness of these incredible structures drives you crazy? Yeah, tell me about it. Tell me about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's exact striations. No, not even close. Saying it, don't make it so, son. Uh, go and look at my video. Go and look at the fucking the study they did in the eighties, the the, uh, the Penn University study. It's it's nothing like the striations. Not even close. You can claim it. And then in that in that thing they say, notice it looks the same. It looks nothing like it. Mark Lehner with his whole like that could be fourth dynasty. That could be fourth dynasty, Dennis. When they snap off their they take their steel chisels and they snap off their little tiny core that they that they ground out over days and days of work. They don't even look at it. They, they don't even show you any analysis of it. The only thing you see is like this. You, you you literally have no striations on there at all. It's like these tiny these these very very fine concentric rings from like the thousands and thousands of rotations that it takes to to grind that stuff out. That's what it looks like. It looks nothing like the deep striations and grooves that you see in the tube drills uh, or on the or on the cores. Um, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Anyone that thinks they look the same uh, should get their vision checked. Maybe that's your name. Oil lamps would leave soot, doesn't leave any soot. Oil lamps leave uh, a residue same as anything else. And there's no evidence for that there either. Anyway. You guys can uh, deal with him in the chat. Um, uh, so yeah, this box is down here. This is a shot from down in. Uh, as you get down here, this is again a special permission required to get down in here. Um, and uh, so we went down here again, and I got into a couple of different spots that I hadn't been into before. It's a labyrinthian network down here. There's more than five kilometers uh, of tunnels and chambers and stuff down here that goes down multiple levels. So I hadn't been down uh, in this in this direction before. This is all modern repair work. So this is where they've what they've been doing the last 15 years is shoring up these tunnels by making walls and stuff down here. It was all in pretty bad shape in the galleries originally. And you can see like it's the modern sort of cut blocks that they've cemented in here to shore it all up. Not down this tunnel, no. Weird audio. Yeah, weird audio on the uh, soundboard there will be. Did I ever find out what John Anthony West thought the Serum Premium was designed for? I don't think he had any thoughts. I mean, it's funny, you know, his guidebook to, um, to Egypt is... Um, is uh it barely mentions the serapium it doesn't he you know he's very much a symbologist and because there's so little writing in the serapium he here. didn't put a lot of value on it at all uh i don't know what his thoughts were about it though ninth house aries 20 bucks you're also a channel member thank you so much for the 20 bucks ninth house aries you're uh you guys are being real uh, generous oh there's my dad unfortunately i'm not going to be um answering my dad's skype call right now <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's cool to see everybody here. Thanks so much for hanging out for a little while while we explore some of this stuff. So here's an interesting spot. Like this is a shaft that goes straight down. So again, this is it's like labyrinthian down here. There are ton you can get lost down here. Um, and there's shafts that go down. So this we're basically almost two thirds of the way down that main shaft. They had humongous light bulbs. You can see them in the hieroglyphics. Yeah, the, the old light bulbs. Mind your step, mind your head. 
Your videos are high on production value, but sometimes devoid of a connection to reality. That's hilarious. And keep eating up the mainstream opinion, I guess. Just, just go with the old appeal to authority. Any appeal to authorities cancels out any actual ideas people have. Maybe you should consider that all scientific advances and pretty much everything always comes from the fringe. Always comes from things that people think aren't connected to reality. That's where new discoveries come from. <laughs> so, um, I love people that say that shit. It's like, I'd literally go to all the time and effort to show you all of the evidence and provide all the context and stuff. And there's like, nope, 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 nope. It's pretty funny. Um, so the point I wanted to share here, and this is gets into kind of the, uh, I wanted to mention, just talk a little bit about, we'll cycle through. We have here, Yusuf's going to say something. He's saying we have here a professional in the house. So we had um, uh, Alma, Alma Allen is the name of the stone carver that was with us. And again, like I said before, he uh, has been profiled in New York Times, very well known in the art world, worked with stone for 35 plus years, has billionaires collect his work. Like he, he works in metal and in stone, but he's been doing it for 35 plus years. Hand chisels, like hand tools, machine tools, and then robotics because he developed carpal tunnel. He uses robots and CNC machines to do his work now. Um, so his opinions on a lot of this stuff is really interesting. And as you know, down beneath the step pyramid, it's one of the magical and really privileges of, of going to Egypt and doing these sort of special permissions is that there's still a number of fragments from these vases that are down here that you can handle and look at. Um, and so things like this. And, of course, you can't touch any of the stuff that's in the museum, but you can touch pieces of these stone vases. This is a particular piece made from diorite gneiss, uh, very hard type of stone, very also quite brittle. Now, the point I want to make about this stuff and the point that Yusuf makes here is the tapering. So you start thick in the center, and then it tapers out to a thinness on the edge. This is incredibly difficult to achieve, uh, particularly when you're talking about doing it by hand. Um, which is which is the orthodox explanation for this stuff? All hand carved, even and this is all before a lathe was even used. They want to dispute that because this is all supposedly third dynasty, right? This all relates back to uh, what they found beneath the step pyramid, which was you know it's all Josa of the third uh, Pharaoh Josa of the third dynasty. Uh, I do outline this in a lot of depth in the last couple of videos about the step pyramid. Uh, if you want to check that out, I would recommend checking it out because. I really think these vases are the smoking gun, the, probably the strongest piece of smoking gun evidence that we have about something advanced happening in the in the very early time frames. Because we have here a really clear cut example of stuff, technology that that basically ceases immediately. Like this, th these vases essentially all but disappear from the record after the third and fourth dynasty, because there's forty or fifty thousand of them found um, underneath the step pyramid, and even then. At Saqqara, they, they admit that these are probably heirlooms. It's literally in the museum at Saqqara where they say these were heirlooms that were inherited from the first and second dynasties. We don't really know, though, how old they are. They were, they were found in first and second dynasty tombs, or they've got scratched writing on them that say first or second dynasty, yet they're all taken by Joseph and buried with him. So it's like this funny game of attribution that goes on. But regardless of that, these essentially disappear from the record after this point. Everything after this point is handmade alabaster vessels um, that very much fit the primitive tools and techniques that we know we used. Uh, you know, these these sort of rotating chisels with flint chisels on them made from alabaster. And they're, they're not as precise. They don't show the same symmetry. They don't show the same sort of tapering and things like that that we see here. All of these advanced aspects of these things all disappear from the record. And by the way, we find these objects going back far into time like far into the archaic age uh we find them in in burials that have been carbon dated to you know fifteen thousand years ago uh we certainly find them in a lot of pre-dynastic sites the schist disc comes from supposedly a first dynasty tomb um the tape it. It. so the taper on these things is, is remarkable now obviously it's also translucent so the stuff's fairly thin it's quite brittle when it gets this thin it's difficult to shape yeah right Oh, and it's tapered too, like to the edge being. Confident that what produced this is not. Thank you, Dan. The drill 
with the piece of flint, alabaster. You cannot have this kind of control. And pretty obviously a tube drill a mark in the center there. I've made these in wood before. Oh, yeah. yeah right. So he's saying, I've made these in wood before. But this tapering is extreme. Like, this is a, an absolute sign of, of a very, not even with a decent lathe, this is very difficult to achieve. Like, using your hand and a decent lathe in stone like this. Nothing surprises, guys. <laughs> Nothing surprises me. That tapering is impressive. Diorite knives? Absolutely, the advance, like evidence of some significantly advanced yeah, technology to, to create these things. Like tube drill mark. Are they functional? Don't know. Surrender the treasure. That's what he says. Yeah, down, yeah. does say surrender the treasure. All right, so let's move this forward a bit. Get down into like the tunnels. How long? We, what's the time? Yeah, I'm going to move this. Skip this forward a bit. I, I don't want to run you guys much past two hours here. Or probably aiming for two hours. So, so kind of interesting. Like this is down in the galleries of all the galleries and areas beneath the step pyramid. Stone. And I'll show you. Uh, so stick with me because the last thing I'm going to show you is absolutely conclusive Halo proof of, of machining, of advanced te of advanced <laughs> technology being used <laughs> that I just recently kind of noticed. Um. So down here we get. Where is it? We were playing with a little bit of this stuff too. Yeah, there's a little bit, little, little more. Uh, Construction materials from. I think these are. Aldo. These are a few more fragments that we doing. find here. Yeah. Same thing. You this can clearly we see how the, the tube drills drilled out the core of the piece of stone, and then it's shaped probably on a lathe. And this thing is even as as small as this fragment That's is. It's still tapering, uh, that we can see. That's a cool piece. We'd probably be able to make a lot of this stuff today. I think we have the tools and ability to do it, but it's a question of whether or not we do. We definitely do some pretty cool stuff in stonework, um, but it takes some significantly advanced tools to do it. That's the thing. Nobody's ever replicated those types of features in that type of stone using the techniques they say did it. That's the point. Like you just you can't do that stuff with the primitive methods that they say we used in the old kingdom. And there's a, there's a whole bunch the, the vases and stuff. There's a whole bunch of other sort of stuff to it as well. Um, so we come out of here, then you climb up. Yeah, we can do it with cutting edge CNC machines. That's right. This is, yeah, this yes, is and, and Klaus, thank you. I do want to say thank you to everybody that's showing support today. You guys are really generous. I'm, it's amazing. Thank you so much. Very much appreciated. So this is the granite box that's in the shaft. We You get down here and get around it. That's the Persian shaft. That's where we take the photos from. This is a this is an extra ticket, so you can, I don't know how much it is. It's like a couple hundred Egyptian pounds, but you can get into what's called the Persian shaft, which was a shaft dug by the Persians, hence the name, I suppose. And uh, they it ended up on. They went, oh crap, and they found they they, they tunneled in and found this space beneath it, and uh, I assume then tried to penetrate in from somewhere else or climb down or whatever. But um, that shaft is still there, and they've done a nice job renovating it. Yeah, ramp too bad because around that corner there's a whole bunch more of the fragments. Okay. So what I want to share, so I'll show you this stuff too. Like here, here's some more of um, these pieces. This is the piece from last year. Yeah, I remember that. But what I want to show you is what's behind all of this, just to give you an idea of what's down here still, and the scale of what what. So here we go. So behind all of this stuff and tucked away is, is this is a huge pile of this stuff. So same thing, right? It's again forty to fifty thousand of these were found down here. There's still tons of fragments of them down here, and they all a lot of this stuff. There's a bit of pottery mixed in amongst this as well, but all of these these exotic stone types, very hard pieces of stone. There's stuff down there too. Um, you know, amazing that it just sort of gets thrown in there on. Your perfectly radial symmetrical tooling marks and hallmarks of lathe usage. Yes, and and, and Petrie documented this 150 years ago. Um, there's definitely some quartzite stuff down there. There's slate. There's all sorts of things. So what's interesting here, and this is based on what Yusuf says. Again, we're going to see the difference between the handmade stuff, which was also down here, the alabaster handmade stuff, and the precise ancient stuff from very hard stone. And remember, alabaster is nowhere near as hard as these other materials. They're very much easier to work with flint tools. So I'll let him talk here for a second. 
You can't carbon date these pots, no, no carbon in them. It's different than this. So, so my friends, and I'm sure our professional here, our expert will agree that this is the kind of result that will be done with a hand tool. Yeah. First of all, it's not perfectly shaped from the outside, as you can see. No. And in the inside, yeah. there is no control. So the thickness of the edge here is different than the thickness of the edge here. So it's totally two different technologies. You see that? You see that? You, I mean, you guys saw that, right? Like the thickness is, you see how it's not, it's not perfectly round. You've got one fat edge here and one thin edge here. This is the result of these grinding and, and hand tool methodologies working in alabaster. Absolutely 100% different to everything else that we see that's older than that. The ancient is advanced. And what was reproduced during the third dynasty, the result is right here. They couldn't even make the back. The artifact the doesn't lie. We can read the stones even if it doesn't have hieroglyphics. Yeah. That, that was that was Almer Allen uh, talking here. Because that's him here. We have an expert in the house. No. <laughs> and I'm not talking about myself. Oh. Yeah, the bottom. The bottom. Do you, uh, do you agree to what I just yeah. said? Oh yes, of course. The bottom's not even flat, and that's the easiest part. Oh my God! What have you got there? Uh, oh my God! <laughs> and then Christian oh. went and grabbed like there's a big chunk of um, alabaster. That's uh, the, some of the some of the alabaster is machined. And is definitely older, but uh, I think a lot of it may have even been the source for some of their alabaster that they carve stuff like this in later. But uh, we'll get to this alabaster here in a minute. But it was around the corner. He went and grabbed it. It's a big piece of alabaster that still had a tube drill in it. Oh, you picked you so picked that up. That was that was around the corner. I know that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he grabbed it. So, and took it. so he, he it all the way. The doors had more than fifty tons of this, and we used to see pieces like that. With many people on so if you guys remember, if you've seen the video, where's you, where's you bring it in here? There it is. You can sort of see it. There. I've got pictures of this block as well. Uh, Joseph Kokoran, 20 bucks. Keep up the amazing work. Thank you so much for the 20, mate. Cheers. And D Smith, Canadian. Thanks for what you do. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. So this is a piece of the worked alabaster. So there was definitely some alabaster that was machined and had... Um, tube drills and other ev evidence for these advanced forms of technology on it and there was something like 50 to 80 tons of it brought up from beneath the step pyramid and the southern tombs and taken up behind the the step pyramid when they were renovating it and then they just bulldozed it all into the ground they smashed it all up and bulldozed it all into the ground it's all covered up now it's in a big berm that's behind the step pyramid now i, I cover this in the videos that i that i have about the step pyramid if you're interested in learning more but when you poke around out the back of the step pyramid occasionally, and it's getting rarer and rarer every year because pieces just disappear entirely, uh, you can find some stuff up on the surface. So we found on this last trip, we found another piece of it here that actually has a complete tube drill in it. Um, Christy Hoover. To have so many stone vessels just laying around shows that it was easy for whoever made them. Otherwise, they would be very rare and those pieces wouldn't be in a trash pile. Yeah, you're probably right. I think what happened was Joseph probably had them all collected and then buried with him. I mean, like I said, even the orthodox story tells you that those are in, those are inherited pieces and heirlooms from earlier times. Involved and then the, you know, but actually the bottom, what's, what runs underneath has the truth. So why is the bottom is, is, has the ancient uh, advanced results while the... Uh, while the one on the surface is reflecting just the primitivity of the third dynasty i can only think of one thing those who so an interesting piece and yusuf makes an interesting point and i made this point in my videos too which is you tend to find the more advanced work is underground for some reason and in particular this is the case with the step pyramid you have the the granite box you have machined alabaster boxes in the very lowest levels uh, I did show a picture of that in, in a couple of the videos. You have walls that are cased and lined in this sort of machined alabaster with tube drills and everything. But yet the structure on top that is attributed to, you know, Imhotep and Joza is is very primitive. I think they did build the step pyramid, but the, but it seems likely that they probably built it over a pre-existing um, subterranean complex and then reused it. See, there's also a tube drill on the, the top corner here. Uh, in fact, 
getting down into these lowest levels again we did that again recently i saw a bit more of the very lowest levels they didn't want us filming down there there's these big alabaster boxes with tube drills and they're all machined they have overcuts in them um like not serapium size but smaller size but also the funny thing was the, ch the the passages and chambers down there are much different to the other what you were seeing they're much high ceilings like 10 foot ceilings down there and big open chambers so it's almost the deeper you go, it's like the, the better the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure is down there. Very, very strange. Um, all right. So real quick, real quick. How long we got? We got a little, we got 15 minutes here. I wanted to share a little bit of this with everyone. Um, Kufferine Throne. I found, and this was a question that came up from a patron, so I wanted to share this. I found a whole bunch more overcuts um, that I hadn't seen before. So as a reminder... Statues like this one, this is this is the famous Khafre enthroned, uh, supposedly of Khafre from the 4th Dynasty. It's diorite, uh, very hard stone, like harder than granite. It was found in the Valley Temple, upside down in a pit, but beautifully preserved. Uh, this has a bunch of overcuts on it that I hadn't noticed before. So it's an incredible statue. It's still in the, uh, the museum, the Cairo Museum. Um, now, it's going to be a little tough to see. I have some better pictures. There's a tube drill hole in the bottom. But if you look up here, this is what we're seeing. This is in between his legs. There's actually overcuts in between his legs. And you don't get overcuts if you're doing things by hand. Anyone who's looked into it, and I've got a whole video looking at the stone cutting methodologies, um, of the, grinding, the grinding methodologies, you know, analyzing that, it's a very slow rate of removal of, of stone, which is how they supposedly did this, right? If you go with the, well, the Egyptians did it with time and effort and pounding stones and, you know, grinding away with a little copper bar or whatever with sand, you don't get overcuts. You get overcuts from power tools, from machining. And when you look in between the legs, it's the same thing you see under the armpits and at the seat uh, on a bunch of other statues that I've documented in other videos, but I hadn't noticed these before. Uh, they're between his legs, and we'll, we'll look at them in a minute. And one other thing I always like to point out is that you'd never see that type of those types of cuts, all those types of polish in the glyphs, right? So the glyphs that are on this statue, you can see the chisel marks, you can see the pounding marks. They're done with a hand and a chisel, right? They're not perfect. They're well done, but they're they're clearly done by hand. That's fine. The difference is is that, and you know, you get. This is, I think, contemporary with the statue because it's all polished. You don't see the same polish on the glyph. This this lotus flower thing, I think, was original. I think the glyphs were added later. Um, so here we go. Let's have a look on the the overcuts. So oh, up. I don't know if you can see that. There's actually an overcut in here. There's probably a better picture of it here. And it was difficult to capture. There's an overcut here right there let's see this this is okay this is better so you see it starts down here runs up and stops here you can sort of it's 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 difficult to capture on film you can feel it with your hand but you can see where it's it's clearly cut like there's like a, almost like a saw cuts went in and just cut a little too deep when they were cutting in here um and here's one on the other side so here's this is like that circular hole between his ankles and and if you you scroll up here, you can see it run right up through here. There's an overcut right on, on where this uh, where these where his legs are. And I hadn't observed these before. I hadn't hadn't seen them before. I'll try and capture them again a little better next time uh, than what I'm showing you here. I thought I got some video of it, but I didn't. Uh, also found a bunch of these Jeremiah Tree Dweller. The precision symmetry is uncanny. It is. Also, uh, in, at Karnak Temple, in these quartzite chapels or whatever they're called, also found a whole bunch of overcuts. This is what these chapels look like. Originally, like giant single pieces of, uh, of quartzite or of um, alabaster, actually. Uh, overcuts in um, stone here. Again, not really something that happens with a grinding tool or some slow method of removing, um, removing material. Same thing. Uh, you see overcuts here in um, in the corners. And it's actually been polished really well, but you see where it starts down the bottom here and it's run up in that corner. Whoops. 
starts down the bottom here and it you actually there's actually a, a little extra one in here where they sort of dipped it in twice and it comes up here it's just evidence for some powerful tool that's removing uh, material again you see that in the corner right and there's, there's definitely a grooved overcut a uh, like a dipping circular saw again you there's no evidence for that people don't say anybody use circular saws but explain this is a flat surface how do you get like a shallow like circular cut with a grinding bar <laughs> it doesn't happen uh falcon quest thank you for the 10 bucks mate uh overcuts here these are everywhere now you find them everywhere uh, again we see uh, uh circular saw markings on the side here this is um the result of a circular saw you can actually see the circular shape to it all right another dipping uh, circular saw cut with actually a little like where they, they they started another cut next to it and then backed out straight away like this cut right here is, is there and then this has actually been a, a deeper overcut like a proper overcut We also see this stuff on some of the obelisks. Again, I, I really need to do that video on Karnak because you have these, you have overcuts on these channels that run up the obelisks as well. In fact, a couple of the obelisks show some really clear overcuts um, in these uh, in these channels in the side here. I'll just share this one with you, and we'll move on. But uh, you can see that here on that left side of this channel, it's very clean. Like you can almost see the in in the glyphs and everything. So if we look at this part here, bottom right corner, this is. This is like a part of a glyph, and you can see how it's bruised and it's pounded. It's been done with pounding stones. If, once you get in close to this stuff here, uh, let's go even. Oh, no, let's go 150. You can see how smooth it is. Like it's not the result of pounding or anything like that. It's it's an overcut that's made from some sort of rotating power tool uh, that cut a little bit too deeply into the uh, into the granite. So. You see this on a lot of the obelisks in um, at Karnak. Okay, so the one last thing I wanted to share with you at Karnak was, if you guys remember like um, the giant thumb that we saw there of conglomerate quartzite that's part of a huge statue. We we came around to that area and we're like, where's the, where's the thumb? They've moved the thumb, and they had moved the thumb, but they're actually doing something, and we and they they're actually they're, they're now putting it together with other pieces from this giant statue, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, the thumb was out there on its own before, but now they've actually put it together with the rest of the arm. So what I'm what I'm touching here, this is the shoulder. I mean, it's remarkably smooth. Um, and again, this material, if you're not familiar with this this thumb, it's conglomerate quartzite, which is harder than granite, and it contains big chunks of flint in it. And flint is, you know, that's what's used to cut granite. So getting this result from this type of stone. It's crazy. And to think that this was a single piece. Um, Yusuf's story about his father making the disc of Sabu levitate. No, I haven't I haven't heard that one from him specifically. I once read about the evidence for ancient there's the, so this is the giant thumb, right? So the thumb and the hand, it's holding the scroll. Dead finger, thanks for the ten bucks. And you once read about evidence of ancient tools and tech being held privately in the collections of very wealthy people. Wouldn't surprise you. Yeah, it's uh maybe <laughs> maybe so here's the thumb now this piece used to just be on its own but they've again they've put it together with the uh and it's you know with the rest of the arm now what's cool about this is that we didn't know if the thumb this hand was part of a seated statue or a standing statue because sometimes they're the hands are on a seated statue sometimes the palms are flat sometimes they're, they're fists like this holding holding that scroll end but because they put this arm together, we know that it was part of a standing statue. This must have been absolutely gigantic. In fact, his, his might be part of what could have been the head over here. Like this might be... Um, it's possible that this is like one of the eyeballs where over, over here. This might have been one of the eyes for the statue. But absolutely gigantic. The fact that this is... Um, that this thing was uh, was a standing statue, like that's the shoulder to the to the hand here, and because otherwise the elbow would have been bent for a seated statue. So this thing must have been absolutely huge, and made from a single piece of conglomerate quartzite, just just monstrous. 
Um, so I'm really pleased they're starting to put these pieces together because this is actually like new information. We didn't know what sort of statue this was and now we know it was a standing statue, which is just crazy. So Granite Graveyard at Karnak. I got a lot, I got a lot to talk about at Karnak. We need to do that video. Okay. All right. Okay. <sighs> right, we're nearly there, chat. We're nearly there. We're getting to the very last thing here now. So the very last thing here has to do with this box at Elephantine Island. Elephantine Island, Upper Egypt. I'll just let this play for a minute because this was actually pretty funny. This happened. Uh, I I, tripped, I had a piece. I moved a piece of granite uh, inadvertently. One of the broken bits in here. And you'll, you'll you'll hear that in a minute. But we're gonna look at this box here. Again, there's I've learned something about this box that is absolutely amazing, and I think it's 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 absolutely smoking gun proof of um, some advanced machining being used. Whoops. Ben's not lifting 500 kilos of granite. You hear use of cough here. Yeah. Just my foot. Yeah. So <clears throat> the box is amazing, right? We we I've kind of we've looked at this in the past. I need to we're going to take I'm making a video right now that's going to look at this a little more. Amazingly sharp corners, 90 degree bends. There's a, there's like a little alcove in here. It has tube drills in each corner in this area. One, two, three, four of them. Now, this is the thing I want to talk about. All right. So I don't know what you call this. Is it a cornice? Is it a balustrade? Is it a, an extrude? It's like a a rail or something and again all single piece granite yes so it's a circular formation i don't know what what's the name for this i, I don't know what this is but what's uh <laughs> what's interesting is when you look at this now it runs down both sides and i didn't realize this but it also has a, a t-junction here where it runs down the side like this this was a fatter piece that ran all the way down the side and the same thing on here unfortunately it's all been broken off right yeah there's a broken piece of granite settle down people it's okay i didn't i didn't break anything <laughs> Um, but so it's, it's not just around the top and the bottom, but it also ran down the sides. Structure was also because only sun would be See this? It would have ran all the way down here, but it's been smashed off. <laughs> <laughs> Heinrich. And you see this on the other side. And what's interesting is what it what is going on here. And we'll come back to that in a minute, right? I'll, I'll, this is the real little piece of smoking gun evidence that I want, I'm doing a video about now that I hope to get out before I go back to Egypt. Now, interestingly, this is not the only box that was here. There may have been several of these things. For sure, there's the black box that was the same as this. Um, Look at this. Because there's another piece here that uh, I want to show you Just real beautiful. quick. That's no longer that here. Cannot do with pounding. Yeah, no. Well, this corner here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, see that? So this is this is the piece I want to look at. So the black box, this black granite box, had the same feature. Yeah, it had the same. You see this Y piece here, like this T T junction. This is like the top of it on that same spot we were looking at on the elephantine box where this 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 cornice whatever it is balustrade thing uh ran down it. Now this piece is gone. Like I I've never I've I've looked for it in the last year and I haven't found it. So somebody's nicked off with this at some point or hidden it somewhere. But I haven't found this piece again, but we know it was there. I've got the photo, you know, evidence of it here. But this is what That would be nice. This, so this is, is what, what uh or pieces from this box here. So there's, again, they were, like I said, they're pieces from this box over here, which was a, a, black a black granite, granite box. This is just here. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and then you have this, um, tom, uh, like Greek Roman time. These guys were uh, inscribing on it. They were planning on cutting this and then uh, taking this piece and using it for something, and it failed. So I guess they just left it here when they tried to quarry this. But yeah, the inside of this this incredible box that was uh, that was left here. Now, right, let's let's get to the interesting part. Go back. Here we go. Okay. So we want to look at what's happening here on this, on this, the cornice that's on the back end here. And remember, we talked about Omar Allen and the stonemason, the stone carver, because his opinion here is going to matter too. You see what's going on here? It's like it's been like. It's a curious thing because this could be unfinished. They would faceted it first. It's faceted. And then they, huh? and then they would smooth it out to make it perfectly round. It is faceted, isn't it? It's so strange. So you guys see that, right? It's faceted. It's an unfinished piece because up yeah. there it is already smoothed out. So up here? here's this transition between faceted. Oh uh, yeah. So this has been faceted. And the importance of that, let's see, I want to get, I've got another video of it here that's really quite good. Here. And, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute. You can see it quite clearly here. Okay, so. You see how it's faceted. So, so this is <clears throat> what's really interesting about this. It's halfway up this line. This is where this faceting has been, has been polished out. And this is the power of unfinished work the, the unfinished work is almost more valuable than finished work because it gives us a glimpse into how this stuff was made and clearly they were shaping this by faceting it in these lines and then they would polish it out and the transition is actually halfway up this line it, it goes fully smooth and then all of these other cornices these 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 this round thing on the rest of the box is smooth now what's interesting about this is that you cannot do this and you would not have a result of this doing this by with hand tools and this was something that Omar Allen um, confirmed he said this is he said the only way that you can get a result like this is by using some rotating tool some high speed rotating tool in a jig and then running it down this thing and creating the shapes like that if you, if you think about it if you were doing this say you were doing this with a chisel you had like a steel or a flint chisel and you were trying to facet it by hammer, hammering on it, you'd, you'd see the chisel marks. We'd literally see the chisel marks. We'd see the pounding marks. It would be, it would be um, uneven and all these types of things, but that's not what we see. We see clear, straight lines of faceting where they were just running a rotating tool that was chewing that material away and creating this shape. And they was running it up and down to create these facets on this thing to give that thing its rough shape and then presumably another tool came along and polished out those and and you know ground out these facets to give it its rounded appearance. This is a hundred percent only doable with machine tools. This doesn't happen with any form of hand tools. Like that's what that's what was so amazing about this to me. Is like there's lots of other examples and you, of, of stuff that and I think that falls in the same category, like the tube drills, the circular saw marks, some of the other striations and things. But this is like an actual example of shaping stone that you cannot get with hand tools. This was done with a machine tool. And it's it's that the power of sort of unfinished work, right? And you can see that where the faceting stops up here and it transitions to... So here's where it stops. And then this is where the other tool... This is as far as they got with their polishing of it out. And for whatever reason, this piece of this stone was left un, unfinished, which is amazing. Uh, really, really grateful that whoever made this thing didn't quite finish the job because okay. this faceting and those straight lines, imagine, just again, imagine trying to do that with a flint chisel. Like you just, that's not the result you get. Um, hand plane over stone? What sort of hand plane are we talking about here? <laughs> and then, uh, and then of course, you know, the rest of the box is, is amazing as it is too, right? So uh, I always like to point this out to people as well. Uh, these tube drills in the inside of the box are actually right butted up against the corners on two axes. So they're butted up against the bottom corner and the side corner. Um, Many things here. We can see you see that? So on these sides, imagine how are you how are you cutting those out with your big tube of... You're grinding this out with a big tube of copper 
and your bow drill. Like, wh- where's the room for any of those mechanisms or anything to spin and, and control that thing? Your, your, tu- your tube drills wouldn't end up going straight. You, you're, you're running into the problem of your material on these sides. Like, cutting a hole, try and do this in wood, figure this out. Try and get a drill and something behind a, a bit that's cutting out a shape like this in a corner like this and make it straight. It's very difficult. Like, you need some very specific gear to be able to do this. Either offset drills or something like that or something that's narrow enough where you can control it and go and drive it in here but this is not achievable uh, again with any of those hand tools um mechanism like just the placement of these of these holes is insane uh it's a whole other thing and then just you know th- th- there's a few of these boxes one of these boxes is in the, the temple of edfu as well uh in the center of it they obviously made a number of them they've got this whatever for whatever reason this this seated thing in here um just to add to the complexity of it. And then we have another look at... Um, it is a TARDIS, isn't it? Yeah. Go to the black granite one. You see where it was cut off there. And look, Ellie, you will find the drawing. Yeah. That was left. That's Johanna James. She was just calling it the, the original TARDIS. <laughs> so it's interesting, right? These, these, these balustrades and protrusions. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with... Uh, the last thing I want to show is is where else do we see these protrusions? We see these types of lines. I'll show you where we see them. We see them on objects like this. We see them on columns like this. These giant single piece columns. And a lot of these go back to the Old Kingdom. This one's at Bastet. It's probably the best example I've ever seen. You see the same thing. We see some of the other features that we talked about that are very difficult to achieve, like tapering. You can see how the ends of these... Um, these little uh, balustrades taper up at the end. Also very difficult to achieve. Like, the, this is, it's silly that people think this was done. And they stamp these things out like they're in a factory too, by the way. Like, you go to Tanis, there's dozens of these. The same size. Um, huge. But this is the best preserved one that I've ever seen, which is at, at, at Bastet. Um, all single piece granite. And in fact, at the ends of these columns, like at the top end and on the bottom ends where we see them, they have centering holes. And it's not for like plugging anything in because the bases that they would stand these columns up on don't have like little nubs to fit into a centering hole. I think there's a chance a lot of these, at least they were shaped on these on massive vertical lathes. I don't know how else to explain it. Chris Dunn thinks the same thing. Uh, gigantic vertical lathes. Uh, and you actually see centering holes at the, at the tip of... Um, in fact, I'll, I'll show you that one real quick while this video is playing. Let me see... And I just said there, like that box yeah. reminds me of um, Elephantine yeah, Island. Too, huh? Or that, that column reminds me of Elephantine Island. Where's Bastet? Here we go. Yeah, I'll show you here. So this is the other pieces of it. I'll just show you a couple of pictures real quick. Hopefully this shows up, but you can see it here. Yeah, you can see it here. So there's the, that's the end of the column with the centering hole. And you see the same thing uh, on the other ends of these columns that we find at... Um, at uh, at Tanis, yeah, they're just they're just remarkable. So, anywho, anywho, where is it? Music on. So, let me try and do a little bit of chat here, and we'll wrap this. Uh, we'll bring this home, guys. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Thank you so much for all the support in the chat. It was been it was epic. Um, you want to ask why? I want to ask why. I think it's possible they were uh, they were vertical lathes. Yes. I don't think they're uh, I don't think they're uh, geopolymer. Let's just say that. So, Dennis Stocks and I tear apart and I like Dennis Stocks um, experiments and I get into those in my videos. Um, I don't think he's explaining this with his hand tools. Put it that way. So. Yeah, guys, thanks so much for hanging out today. I hope you enjoyed um, the stream. I uh, enjoyed putting this together for you. I'm sorry it's been a minute since I've published something. Uh, I'll be putting out a video in the next few days before I head back to Egypt. But, uh, yeah, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much for the support. Everybody that supported me in the chat and just anyone that spent their time here as well hanging out, thank you so much. It's very greatly appreciated. Uh, I couldn't really do it without you guys. 
um, without the support. I am going to take a quick break here for a little while, but I'm going to continue. We're going to keep talking about this stuff for a little while over on my Twitch channel after this. So give me 10, 15 minutes. And if you want to, come and join me for the little after party over on the Twitch channel. It's twitch.tv slash UnchartedX if you're interested. Uh, we'll be continuing to go through some of this and talk about it uh, over on Twitch. But after I take 10 or 15 minutes here and uh, we'll go there. So, But yeah, you guys are uh, are awesome. And Ancient Sanctum, Dan, thank you guys for modding. Yep, check out, check out Ancient Sanctum's channel uh, if you get the chance. And I do have a whole bunch more planned and coming soon. Once I get done with this travel, we'll be back to pumping out the videos um, as best as I can. But I'm tr like I said, I'm trying to get a little bit more in-depth video about that box on Elephantine Island and what that 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 uh, that that whole thing that I just went through means because I think it's really interesting. Now, there's a whole bunch of other topics that we saw in Egypt that I didn't manage to get into today. But um, yeah, you guys have been awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Hope everybody. Uh, enjoys the rest of the weekend whatever's left of it for you all wherever you are and we'll uh we'll see you in the next one but uh yeah check it out uh i talked about a lot of videos in here i've been over a lot of these topics in several of them but yeah we saw some interesting new stuff on this on this last trip so um yeah you guys uh take it easy twitch channel again it is uh twitch.tv forward slash uncharted x and again give it 15 minutes before it goes live but I will be uh, I will be over there in a little while here. So, where is the Twitch? You don't want, don't know what it is. It's a different website. It's not YouTube. It's just a live streaming platform that I stream at. I stream on it like you know two three times a week when I'm here. So, uh, you know I do a fair bit of live streaming. We do I put together a lot of the videos. I share a lot of the video editing. Uh, for example, we were putting together this all of the material for this YouTube live stream on a stream on Twitch so uh, yeah come and check it out and yeah US yeah, that's right USA time change tonight yay right more daylight savings for everybody so cool man thank you Jesse Phil thank you and again thank you everybody that uh, that um, sent in super chats or joined the uh, channel members it's much much appreciated and uh, yeah alright I'm gonna wrap it up there guys so thanks so much I, uh, I'm sorry if I missed a lot of the chat. I was trying to keep up with it a little bit, but then uh, yeah, I'm also trying to get through these topics without um, taking up all all day. We we did all right. We did uh, we did. Uh, somebody actually just someone actually just typed into that Twitch channel uh, chat right now. Actually, funnily enough, yeah. So we're here for a couple of hours. But you guys enjoy it. If you didn't catch it all, the replay will be here. Uh, for people that are watching this afterwards, the chat replay is available, I think, in the recording. So, all right, guys, thanks very much. We'll catch you in the next one. Enjoy it. Enjoy your weekend.